Hello everyone and welcome back. Welcome to the Bootstrap section of the course. Bootstrap is a very common framework used for front-end web development, and it's actually going to help us save a lot of time from dealing with CSS manually. But first we need to ask ourselves, what is a framework? What makes it different than just a library or some sort of package? Well, a framework has a couple of key qualities. Uh, some of those qualities are inversion of control, meaning you're giving up control to the framework. And the framework is going to have some sort of default behavior, and it's a non-modifiable framework code. And basically what this means is the framework is going to be defining the rules for you to follow, not the other way around. Usually we've been seeing ourselves write some code, defining the rules, and then executing the code. Here the framework is going to tell you what the rules are as far as how you can manipulate the code. So there's an inversion of control there between what we're used to. And we'll get more used to this idea of what a framework is when we reach uh, Django because Django itself is a web framework for Python. Now a large part of Bootstrap is not memorization but really understanding how to reference the documentation for your own use cases. And this section will focus on some of the more common use cases of Bootstrap but the main thing to get across here is your ability to reference the documentation, understand what you need to get out of it, and then apply it to your own website. Before we begin though, let's talk about Bootstrap version 3 versus version 4. So Bootstrap 4 is currently still in development at the time of this filming and will be released soon. Right now it's an alpha, so likely beta will come out after that, and then after that we'll get some sort of uh, first initial release. Now it may already be released by the time you're viewing this video, but if it hasn't yet, Bootstrap actually makes it really easy for you to use the alpha version or the beta version if that's out by the time you're watching this right now. So you can actually quickly and easily use uh, whatever the current version of Bootstrap 4 is while Bootstrap 3 is still the main release. For our level of use, the differences between version 3 and version 4 won't really be apparent to us. We're not gonna dive so deep into Bootstrap that these differences are even going to be on our radar. Uh, while version four is a major rewrite from version three, we are really not gonna dive deep enough to notice any of the differences. A few of the differences are things such as panels are now being replaced by something called cards, larger default font sizes, there's a new grid tier, the use of Flexbox throughout the version four framework, and a move from less to SAS. Now, a lot of these terms, if you're new to Bootstrap and new to CSS, probably don't mean anything to you and you have no idea what I'm referencing here. If that's the case, really don't worry about it. We're not going to dive into Bootstrap so deep in this course, nor will we need to, that we need to understand all these differences between version 3 and version 4. So again, the most important thing to get out of this section of the course is the ability to reference the Bootstrap documentation. So let's explore the documentation and see some examples of what Bootstrap actually looks like. The documentation is amazing. It's full of examples that makes it really easy to copy and paste and modify in your own code. Let's go to getbootstrap.com. Okay, so here we are at getbootstrap.com. You'll see a little banner here that says, oh yeah, Bootstrap 4 is coming. You can click on that if you want more information on version 4. But you'll notice that there's actually links on quickly getting started with version 4. Right now, it's in alpha, so who knows, by the time you're viewing this video, it may already be in beta, or it may already be on its first release. But let's go back and work with the current release, which is right now version 3. And again, for our use cases, either one will work fine for you. So if you click on Download Bootstrap, it takes you to this Getting Started link. And there's essentially two ways to use Bootstrap, as far as in conjunction with your web application. You can either download the source code itself, which is going to be uh, the font files, the source list, some JavaScript, etc. Or you can actually just use what's known as a CDN. A CDN is a content delivery network, and you can think of it as essentially working in a really similar manner to how we use Google Fonts. So Google Fonts API or the fontlibrary.org essentially allowed us to copy and paste a CDN link into our HTML file and then it just got the files over the internet. And that's basically what we can do here. We can see the links here that allow us to copy and paste into our HTML file to actually link to bootstrap code, which is great. You can see here there's the style sheet as well as some uh, compiled and minified JavaScript. And we'll be talking about this when we actually uh, open up the editor and start dealing with bootstrap. But 
essentially we're just going to be copying these links. You can also manually download the links and then save them onto your computer and link to the local reference on your computer. But that just is a bunch of downloaded files that we don't really need. Uh, if you're trying to make your application self-hosted without any internet, maybe you're going on a train ride or something, you want to play around with Bootstrap, then you will have to download it manually that way. But if you have access to the internet, then you can just use uh, CDN. And if you're watching this video, then it's most likely that you do have access to the internet. Okay, so coming back up here, I want to explore the documentation a little more with you. If you click on getting started, you'll take you to this link. And you'll notice that beyond the download, there's uh, just basic information like what's included, which is right here, what pre-compiled bootstrap looks like. It's really just a bunch of CSS files, a bunch of font files, and then two JavaScript files here. There's the bootstrap source code. And then if you keep going down, there's just uh, basic information, basic template information, etc. And then there's some examples. So here are some examples of what the framework looks like. I'm going to click on these to open up a new tabs, but hopefully you can begin to see an idea of what Bootstrap actually does. So here are some very simple templates of what Bootstrap looks like. So you can see there's a nav bar here, there's some sort of theme example, and then there are some buttons here. There's also the grid template, which we'll be talking about later on. There's a jumbotron template. There's a narrow template, again, with a jumbotron here, and then there's a navbar template. And we're gonna be walking through a lot of these things throughout this section of the course. Jumbotrons, navbars, grids, those are all really common things that we are going to cover with Bootstrap. But for more specific things, if you scroll back up here and click on components, this will take you through basically all the components that CSS, or excuse me, Bootstrap has to offer. So if you want more details on for instance, a nav bar, you just click here on the side to nav bar, and it has really great documentation. It'll tell you what the default nav bar looks like, and then it has tons of example code. So this is an example of what this nav bar looks like. So you can see it has a drop down menu, and we'll be discussing what this looks like later on. And then it also has the code for it. So you can always reference the code, as well as what the code is going to look like. So if you want a brand image in your nav bar, it shows you an example of what that looks like, and shows you an example of what that code looks like. If you want forms, input forms in your navbar, maybe a search button, shows you what that looks like as well. So you can keep going down here, maybe you want to check out how progress bars work with Bootstrap. Well you just click on Bootstrap here on progress bars, and then you can see the basic example of what a progress bar looks like, and it shows you the code for it as well. Then if you want it with a label, it also shows you that. So you can see that Bootstrap is basically just a bunch of predefined CSS styles that are really going to help you, and they each have their own class. And we're going to discuss how to actually use these in a lot more detail in future lectures. What I want you to just get out of this lecture is the fact that you can reference basically anything you want about Bootstrap and see example code for it, as well as what it looks like, all on the documentation page. Okay, so the very first thing we're going to be discussing when we talk about Bootstrap is how to use these buttons, these really simple buttons. And you'll see that they actually already have classes defined to them. So very basic examples uh, look like this, left, left, middle, right. But they'll also have their own colored classes, which we're going to be exploring later on. All right. So go ahead. I encourage you to just uh, jump around the documentation and check it out. But coming up next, we're going to talk a lot more about Bootstrap and buttons. Thanks, everyone. And I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to part one of the Bootstrap section of the course. A key feature of Bootstrap are its default classes. You can call these classes to quickly and easily build good looking features for your web application. We're going to be going over button classes as well as the container and jumbotron classes. First though, we need to start off by showing how to connect an HTML file to Bootstrap itself. Let's get started. I'm going to open up my text editor to an HTML file as well as my browser and check out getbootstrap.com again. Let's get started. All right, so here I have my editor open as well as my browser. I have an empty HTML file that's linked to my browser. Let's get started by showing you how to actually connect an HTML content to Bootstrap. So I just typed HTML, I got the basics going. And if you go to getbootstrap.com and click on download Bootstrap, it'll eventually take you to this getting started tab. And you basically have two options here. One is to download the Bootstrap files yourself and then link them locally on your computer. So you'll be downloading a CSS file and then you can link that locally just as we've done for other CSS files. 
or you can just use the CDN, which basically is an online host for you to connect to. So you can just grab this link right here, and you can grab all of these if you want, but we're keeping it simple, so we'll just grab this right now, which is the only link we need for this particular lecture. And if you scroll down, you'll actually see there is pre-compiled bootstrap, bootstrap source code, but keep scrolling down, there's a basic template. So usually we'll probably end up starting with this entire basic template, which includes things such as jQuery and some JavaScript code. But right now we don't know enough about that to actually use it. So we're just going to use the very first link we saw here, which is the latest compiled and minified CSS. So if we zoom in just a little more, this is the link I'm using. All right, so now that that's ready to go, let's actually test it out by creating a heading one in the body. So we'll say bootstrap exclamation mark. And let's actually comment out with control or command forward slash the link to that style sheet just to make sure it's working. So if I refresh this project.html, it's linked to it, I see bootstrap. Now if I turn the link back on and uncomment it and refresh, notice what happens to the font. The font changes to bootstrap's default font. And that is one quick and easy way you can tell if Bootstrap is successfully working. Keep in mind, you do need an internet connection for this to work. If not, you'll have to download the files manually. Either way, you're going to need the internet connection at some point in time. But if you're watching this video, it's probably because you have an internet connection. Let's discuss a container class. So I'm going to create a div tag. And right now, I'll leave it classless, but I'm going to add heading one that says hello world, exclamation mark, save it, refresh. And I can see that my hello world heading is actually right against the left-hand side of my browser. So as I expand my browser, it's still there on the left-hand side. What I can do to try to center it a little bit off that left-hand browser is put it in what's known as a container class. And what's really nice about Bootstrap, it basically comes with a bunch of predefined classes for you to easily call in your code. And you don't have to worry about memorizing all of these class names that we're going to be seeing. The main thing you have to learn out of this section of the course is how to reference the documentation, which we'll be showing you when we talk about buttons. But notice that hello world is now in the class container. So if I refresh this, I see that it's centered and down a little bit. So basically it just affected the margin spacing. And you can see here as I expand this window, or as I begin to collapse it more, it's tries its best, best to say a little more centered or a certain distance off of the left-hand side of the browser, which is exactly what we want. So let's delete this now and continue on. Okay, now that we've explored the container class a little bit, it's gonna be something we explore a lot more as we continue through Bootstrap. It's time to talk about the button classes that are available to you in Bootstrap. If you come to the link getbootstrap.com slash CSS, which if I expand this browser, You'll see it here, it's in the top nav bar. You can just click on CSS. There is a right-hand side column here with some sections and click on buttons. And basically Bootstrap comes with some button classes that you can easily call and you can call them on three separate types of tags. You can call it on an anchor tag. Remember that's a tag with a link to it. You can call it on a button tag, something we haven't actually talked about yet, but we're going to be doing in this section right now. And an input tag, something we've used for forms but we'll actually be discussing forms in the next lecture. So right now let's explore using the button tag, which we haven't actually seen yet in action. Now the button tag basically allows us to create a button. Let me scroll back down to where we had the buttons. Okay, I just scrolled back down to the buttons and let's add a button in to our HTML code. So I will say button and we'll keep the type button and name button to be the default there. And let's say something like click on that button, we'll refresh, and you, now you can see we have a button here that I can click, but really nothing happens. And the reason we really didn't talk about button tags in the HTML section of the course or the CSS section of the course is because before we know JavaScript, there's not much we can actually do with these buttons themselves. Right now we're learning about them because of the typical styling choices you use with Bootstrap on them, but keep in mind we won't actually be able to really activate anything upon the click of a button besides a simple connection to another website. But we can do that also with an anchor tag. It's not until we reach JavaScript where we're actually going to be clicking buttons and making things change on the web page. All right, so here's my button tag. 
Now let's discuss bootstrap classes with buttons. And this is basically the way you're going to be using the bootstrap documentation. I keep stressing that documentation is really important with bootstrap and I'm going to show you why. So we keep scrolling down on buttons and you see here we have options. So these are available buttons that quickly create a style button. And there's basically just a couple default button types. There's default primary success info warning danger. And the way you utilize these classes with Bootstrap and the way you utilize Bootstrap in general is just by specifying class is equal to and then you specify whatever class you want. So let's say if we come back here to our project HTML, we want to turn this click button into the style of a success button. So we just come here, look at success and see it's btn space btn dash success. So there's button or btn dash success, save it, come back here, refresh, and now it looks like a success button. Great. So coming down, we can keep seeing that there's more stuff we can add. So fancy larger or smaller buttons, you can continue to add for more classes. So now I can add btn-lg. So let's do that. I'll say btn-lg to make that into a large button. So if I come back here, refresh, we can see that the button's gotten a little bit larger. We can continue down, see things such as active state. So buttons will appear pressed when active. We can also think, do things such as make it a disabled state. So if I want to make it look disabled, all I have to do is say disabled is equal to disabled. So let's copy and paste that. And that's actually another parameter or property of this button tag, but let's save it. And let's actually create another button so we can compare it to. So I will create one button, just copy and paste this, that has disabled on. And let's say this is, I am on. And the bottom one will say disabled. And the one of has I am on, we are going to delete this disabled marker on it or disabled parameter. We'll save it, refresh here. And we can see the I am on, I can click on that. And if I hover over disabled, Google Chrome doesn't let me click on it. It shows that nice little icon that says this is not clickable. And as a quick note, you can always override these default styles. So maybe you like the success button, but you want to make the text a different color. All you have to do is in your CSS file, grab the btn, btn-success, call it your own class in your CSS file, and you could overwrite individual aspects of it. It won't overwrite everything, it'll just overwrite whatever aspects that you want to overwrite. So if you wanted to overwrite the text color or the text background, you could do that yourself, just with your CSS, and just calling this class. So success, you could do that yourself. All right. Now let's finally talk quickly about the Jumbotron, which is something we'll be using a little bit throughout this course. So to view what the Jumbotron actually looks like, we're going to hop back over to the Get Bootstrap page. And let me expand this so we can see the nav bar. And I'm going to click on Components. And Components, as we scroll down, we'll see a bunch of components that we're going to talk, talk about later on, such as nav bars, labels, stuff like that. But you keep scrolling down, you'll see the Jumbotron component. And we see that Jumbotron is basically a lightweight, flexible component that can extend the entire viewport to showcase key content. So you can think of this almost like a landing page. And this is the most basic Jumbotron. It has some large font here, some large heading, some simple hero unit, whatever, and then a button there. So we can actually just copy and paste this and put it into our HTML. So we say hello world dot 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 is the paragraph. So we'll say something like this is the paragraph. Save that and let's actually see this now on our project page. Refresh and we see here now we have an HTML jumbotron. Usually, however, you're going to want this jumbotron to be within a container so it doesn't take up this entire page. What we will do then is put this inside of a container class. Grab this entire jumbo division or divider there, stick it inside, save it, and now when I refresh, I can see that it's basically centered like it was here on this page. 
And that's really the main idea of Bootstrap. You're gonna come over here, see what you need. So if you wanna know how to use an alert, you just come here to the alert and you can read the examples here. And you see here there's a class alert, role alert, etc. So, so far what we learned about were the basic button classes, which you can always check out by coming to the CSS page and then clicking on buttons and you can see the various button tags that are available to you. Then we also learned about the container class, which you can think of it as just basically centering stuff on your page. And then we also learned about the Jumbotron class. All right. Thanks everyone. And I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to part two of the Bootstrap section where we're going to be discussing forms. A quick note before we actually begin to dive straight into forms of Bootstrap, I want to talk about Bootstrap in general for just a little bit. Many students get intimidated by Bootstrap when they first approach it. They think they need to memorize all the classes that we cover in this section of the course. Now that's actually certainly not the case. You want to think of this section more as a guide to the documentation and what's really possible with Bootstrap, not as an overview of things that you need to memorize. Even people who work with Bootstrap often or every day are going to be referencing the documentation a lot. What we really want to master here is the skill of gathering and applying information, not just memorizing information. Now let's continue on talking about forms. So Bootstrap comes with many default classes for forms. There's two really important ones that we're going to be covering here. And one of the first ones we're going to cover is a class called form group. So let's explore the various form components that we can use with Bootstrap. And we're going to be referencing the course notes quite a bit. So what I would suggest you do is to open up the part two underscore forms.html file that's under the Bootstrap folder. Okay, let's jump straight to our browser and to our editor to get started. All right, so here I have my editor open as well as my browser. And if I refresh my HTML here, right now I have it linked. So in my browser, this HTML is linked and it also already has the link to the CDN version of Bootstrap. There's an empty body. To get started, I just wanna point out where we can find a lot of this information. If you go to getbootstrap.com, click on the CSS tab, and then click down here where it says forms, it'll take you down to a basic example of forms. And we can see here that we need to wrap labels and controls in a dot form dash group for optimum spacing. And when it says dot there, it's just trying to tell you that it's a class. Remember when we're dealing with CSS, we reference classes with that period or dot. So when you actually type in the class, it will just be form dot dash group. You won't actually have that dot there. So let's see this example, explore a little bit, and let's see what happens when we wrap everything with a form group class. So I will copy this, and there's actually a really nice copy to clipboard button there that you can just use. And I'm going to paste this into my HTML file, save it, and then check it out here in my browser. And we can see right now it stretches from end to end on everything. So what I can do to organize this so it looks a little nicer, is put it all in a container class. And that's something we're going to be doing often when we use Bootstrap, is put everything in different container divs. So let's paste that there, the closing tab, and then grab this entire form and just input it a little more, or indent it a little more. All right, now that everything's in a container class, when I refresh, we can see it's a little nicely centered. So, so far it's looking pretty good. We have our email input, our password input, and we can see some more advanced inputs, things such as a choose file input. So if I click on choose file, we can see that it pops up something for me to choose file. Now, right now we actually can't do anything with this because we haven't learned the backend technologies such as Django to actually accept that file and then do something with it. Here we can see just a checkbox and then the submit button. Now the key class I wanna talk about with forms is this class form group. And what the class form group does is it put spacing in between components of forms so that they look nicer and they just read a little better. So to show you what I mean by this, I'm going to just delete these divs for the first two, refresh, and pay attention to what happens to the spacing here for email address and password. You can see here that they begin to get a little closer. And when we were dealing with our own input forms for some of the previous projects, we saw that we were using tricks such as adding in a break or adding in an empty paragraph to get that margin spacing nice. But all that's taken care of for you in Bootstrap, I'm just doing Control Z here, when you use the class form group. And then let me refresh here, and we can see the spacing is a little readable, more readable now, especially between the actual blocks of the email address versus the password. These are just minor things that Bootstrap is helping you out with a lot by having those classes ready for you. 
And the next class I want to point out is this form control class that's in the input tags. So we have these input tags and we give them this class form control. Let's explore what they do by actually just taking them out. So there's my form control. I've taken them out and I refresh over here. And we can see that by taking out the form control on the input tags, basically we have what looks like almost normal HTML or normal CSS styling, I should say. Let's show one of them on this password input just to see the difference. So with the form control tag, I can see that it's rounding the corners. It's making it stretch the container size. It's actually highlighting a little differently. You can see that the highlighting has a bit of a, almost like an alpha or a blur around the password box versus email. There is highlighting there, but it's not as subtle. And those are really the two classes that are making the forms look nice for Bootstrap. It's the form group and form control tags or classes, excuse me, that you're going to be using on the tags. The div tag for each form, that's the label and input, it should have the form group, and then each input should have the form control. Now let's explore just a few examples of various different inputs that you're going to be using on a form. So I'm going to delete this entire form, and then add in things from the notes. So I'm copying and pasting from part two underscore forms. So let me copy and paste the email submission example. So here we have a label input, and we've actually already kind of explored this, but let's refresh. And this is a typical email address. So we have the email address, the email input, so this is where you would enter your email. And then you'll also notice that it says, we'll never share your email with anyone else. This is really common to have a little explanatory text in, underneath any input. A lot of times it's underneath the email address to give some sort of note like this. What we use for that is this small tag and we give it the class form text text muted. And it says whatever text you want to say behind that. So that small tag basically just says, okay, a small piece of text here. So it's not the same size as a paragraph. So that's another useful tip when you're dealing with forms. If you ever want to give a little note there for a particular aspect of the input form. So that's a email submission going to delete that. And then I want to put in the password submission. Not too much to see here. Let's save it and refresh. And here we can see a password submission. Again, we've already seen this with Bootstrap. Going to copy and paste the next component that I have in the notes, which is a drop down select. So here we can see we have, whoops, the select form. And let's copy all this and indent it a little more just so it's more readable save it and refresh. And here we can see what a drop-down form looks like with Bootstrap. So with Bootstrap, you get this nice interface and we can see that it actually expands the entire width of the container. Again, there are ways to control that with CSS or just by editing the container itself, but this is what a drop-down menu looks like with Bootstrap. If we want multiple select options, let me show you what that looks like. That has also the class form control here. So I can copy and paste this save it, refresh, and we can see here we can have multiple selections. So if I want to select multiple copies, I can do shift and click. And that's basically another example of something very similar to a dropdown, except now I can select multiple options. And the way you do that is you say select, just like we did last time, but now you say multiple. So just to reiterate from the last dropdown option, which I'm going to copy and paste here for you to see, the first one, if I save this and refresh, is just a single selection. If I want a drop down where I can select multiple things using shift or using control or command, what you end up doing is in the select tag, you add multiple. And that's just a keyword. Okay, so moving along, the couple more that I want to show you are the text area with Bootstrap. We can delete these and put it in. Text area, it's also taking the form control. I refresh this and we can see a nice text area, it has those rounded corners. It has the ability for me to grab this and expand it. There's the file upload input. We actually saw that a little bit already, but let's paste that in from the notes. We can see that it's also taking the class, if we look here, form control dash file. So that's another important thing to note when you're dealing with type file input. You want to make sure it has the class form-control-file. And the example here also comes with that small tag that we've seen earlier, 
which is some placeholder block level for help. So this would say something like, oh, please input your resume or something like that. Then you click on choose file and it automatically pops this thing up. Great. And like I mentioned before, we don't know yet how to actually deal with something when we upload it. We still need to learn the actual backend technologies for that. Now there's two more I want to show you, two more examples, and that is radio button examples with Bootstrap. So I'm going to copy this and we're going to see a couple new tags that we haven't seen yet. And those are the field set tags. So if we come up here, we can see we have a field set tag and it takes the class form group and we also have a legend. So let's actually refresh this and see what that looks like. So here we can see radio buttons and that's the legend tag that's making it look like this. And you can see, hopefully it's visible on your screen, but I have an underline here because it's a legend. And so we see option one is this and that, be sure to include why it's great. Option two, option three is disabled. So if you want something to be disabled, again, that's option three over here. You just put in a disabled call right here, disabled. All right, so nothing too fancy going on here. You can just check that there's classes for each of these. So if you want it to be disabled, you can say form check disabled as the class here instead of just form check. So here we have the class form check, which is really commonly used for radio buttons. And as you may have guessed, check buttons. So we're going to put in a check button example here, copy and paste it from the notes, paste it. Whoops. Let's get rid of that field set and that division, paste it in here. So here we have class is form check, label is form check dash label. Let's refresh, see what this looks like. And here it just says, check me out. We can click, unclick, not much going on here. But if you wanted it, you can put in class form check. And that's really all there is to forms of Bootstrap. So let's copy this entire form from the notes and paste it in so we can see what something with a bunch of options would look like. So I'm going to copy and paste this. And I copied everything, including the form tag. So I will save that, refresh. And here I can see a really large form example. So I have my email. I can see the spacing is nice between the various inputs. There's my password. There's my example select. Here's an example of multiple selects. Here's my example text area. Here's the choose file input, radio buttons, check me out, and then the submit button. And we can always color the submit button with different classes. So before we end this lecture, something I really want to stress here is that you do not have to memorize everything that I just went over. And if it seemed like I was just quickly going over many examples, but not diving deep into them, that's exactly what we're doing for this section of the course. Bootstrap is just being able to see what's possible and being able to reference the documentation. So you have these notes available to you in your class notes. If you ever want to make a form with any of these, you can basically just copy and paste to your own needs or you can always just check out the documentation that has many examples. So here we see a basic example of a form, but we can do things like a focus state, disabled state, et cetera, validation states, uh, inline forms. There's a lot of examples and the documentation, it can be intimidating at first, but really it's all here to help you. Uh, it's just normal people referencing this and writing it. So don't ever be intimidated. And if you have any questions, post them to the Q&A forums. I'm always happy to help you out. Okay, hopefully you now have an idea of what's possible with the forms in Bootstrap and that you're going to be using class form-group a lot whenever you're actually dictating that you have a form there. Okay, thanks everyone and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to part three of the Bootstrap section of the course where we talk about nav bars. Nav bars are those navigational bars that you often see on the top of a website. And we've actually already seen them on Bootstrap's own website. And in this section of the course, we're going to show you how to manually create the basics of a nav bar. So when we start out coding, we'll actually code line by line a very basic nav bar. And then later on, we're just going to be copying and pasting from the course notes. And the reason for that is a lot of the class calls that Bootstrap uses for the nav bar components are really repetitive and kind of hard to memorize. There are things such as nav space, nav bar dash nav, and it gets a little confusing and the naming convention is a little bit of a poor choice, especially if you're trying to memorize things. So we're really just going to be copying and pasting to focus on just accessing the information and learning what it does, seeing what's available with Bootstrap instead of memorizing how you could code out a nav bar from scratch. 
So we'll focus on just the basics for coding it out by scratch. Everything else is just going to be copy and paste from the course notes. So keep that in mind as we continue. We're also going to see briefly how to connect an HTML page to JavaScript and jQuery. And we haven't really discussed those two technologies yet, and we're definitely not going to dive into them uh, really that deeply at all in this lecture, but we actually need them for some functionality of the navbar, such as a drop-down menu being on the navbar, only really works when you connect the HTML page to jQuery and JavaScript. So again, this lecture, really not going to talk that much about JavaScript and jQuery. We're going to do that in future sections of the course, but we will show you now how to connect an HTML page to some online hosted JavaScript and jQuery codes. All right. Let's go ahead and get started by jumping straight to the editor in our browser. Okay, so here I have my editor open. I have an HTML file open and I've already linked it to the latest compiled the minified CSS of Bootstrap. And here I have my body ready to go as well. So if I come over here to the project page, it's linked up. First, let's check out how we can find more information about nav bars in the documentation of Bootstrap. So if we come up here to Bootstrap, you can actually see there's a navigation bar already on Bootstrap. You can see it says getting started, CSS components. So this is what a typical nav bar looks like as you begin to explore the page. And if you just come here to components, it'll take you to the components page. And down here, there's a nav bar section. So click on that. And we can see some information about default nav bar. And we can also see that it requires JavaScript plugins for certain things such as collapsing and drop down menus, which we're going to be talking about later on. So here is an example of a nav bar. There's a brand some links, a drop-down menu, some search tools, link, and another drop-down menu on the right-hand side. And you can copy and paste this entire code if you want to take a look at all this. Instead, what we're going to do is start off by building out the very basics, and then we're going to add in components from the course notes. So let's show you how to just build a very basic nav bar in your HTML file. And then we'll start copying and pasting from the course notes in just a little bit. All right, so the very first thing we need to do is call the nav tag. That's the NAV tag. And that's going to be an HTML tag that we can use to actually begin to build our nav bar. And what we will do here is give it the class nav bar space nav bar dash default. And we'll be adding a few things to that class later on to explore a couple more things about it. And within this nav tag, I'm going to create a div tag, looks like that didn't take, a div tag here and give it the class navbar-header. And this will actually be the header of the navbar, which is usually known as brand. So this is where your company's brand or the main name of the website is gonna go all the way on the left. And inside of this, we add in an anchor tag. There's an href there. And the reason for that is usually when you click on that link, it takes you back to the home page. We'll just leave that as a hashtag for now, and we'll call it company. Let's save that, refresh our page, and see what it looks like. Okay, so here we see that we have company. However, right now, it doesn't look like the actual bootstrap company. So if we come back up here, we can see with the nav bars, if we scroll down to nav bar, that brand usually looks stylized. If we come back here, this looks just like normal HTML links. So what we end up doing is inside of the anchor tag, add in a class called navbar-brand. And hopefully you can begin to see that a lot of the classes start with the word navbar, so it can get a little confusing as far as trying to memorize these things, which is why referencing the documentation is so important for this section. But now if I refresh, I can see it looks like a typical company call. And as I mentioned here, this href would usually take you to the home page, but you can really put in any link here just like for any other anchor tag. So I can say HTTPS uh, colon colon, let's say www.google.com, save that. If I refresh this and I click on this company, now it takes me to google.com. However, right now, we'll just leave this as hashtag and we'll discover later on how we can use the hashtag to link to different parts of the page. Okay, so we have our company brand over on the left. Now let's discuss how to add in more components to this actual navigation bar. So outside of that div, I'm going to create an unordered list. And an unordered list is how you add more things to this nav bar. And to make it look good, we give it the class nav space nav bar dash nav. Pretty repetitive, I know, probably not the best naming scheme, but that's how it goes. And that's why we reference the documentation for a lot of this. And inside of this unordered list, we put in list items 
And then we give in anchor calls, where just like the company or brand page, we could give a link to another page. But right now, we'll just keep it simple. We'll call this item one, put another one in here with an anchor tag, and we'll call this one item two. And let's see what they look like now as I refresh this page. And there is item one, item two. They're linked, so I could click on them to go somewhere, but right now, they don't really lead anywhere because this href is just a hashtag. Now everything we've created so far is lined up to the left. If I want to add components to this navbar that are lined up to the right, I just add in the class navbar-right. And let me show you by adding in a new unordered list and putting in the class, same as last time, nav, navbar-nav, and then I add in here navbar-right. And then we can add in some more list items saying, on the right, save that, refresh, and we can see here we have it on the right. But as I expand this, I can see that it's kind of all the way to the right. What I can do is put everything inside a container tag to try to balance that out a little bit. So I will create div container, and this is something you'll find yourself doing often when you're working with Bootstrap is kind of putting these container tags to contain things. Save it, refresh this, and now I can see this is nicely centered. So even as I expand the page from the left and the right, it's a little more centered around the middle, which is nice. Okay, make sure you don't actually wrap the entire nav bar on the container. Let me show you what happens if we do that. So if I wrap this entire nav here in the container, what's going to happen is the entire nav bar is going to be centered and it won't stretch across the entire page. So that's usually not what you want. You want just the components themselves to be inside the container. So let's undo that. Let's undo this. Great. So saving that, refreshing here. Now we have the nav bars ready to go. So as we continue, I want to briefly discuss keeping a nav bar fixed to the top of the page, even as you scroll down. And in order to really show that, we need to add some more material to this page. So I'm going to just copy and paste this from the notes. But basically, it's just a container class. So let's copy and show what this is. It's a container class with a jumbotron inside of it, it says hello, lorem ipsum, lorem ipsum, another container, more stuff, lorem ipsum, lorem ipsum. So if I save this, refresh my page over here, I can see that I can scroll up and down. But you can see as I scroll down, I eventually lose the nav bar. Now, so a lot of times that's how you want it. You want it so that you scroll down, the nav bar is no longer visible. Other times, you may want the actual nav bar to scroll along with you as you go through the page. So let me add in a little more content here. We'll do one more lorem ipsum, or let's do two more so we can really get the effect. Refresh this page. So we can see I have a little more to scroll down, up and down with, but the nav bar stays on the top and it disappears. If I want the nav bar to actually be fixed to the top of the page, even as I scroll down, I just come back up here to where it says nav class, nav bar space nav bar dash default, and I can add in this class call right here, which is nav bar dash fixed dash top. And this will fix it to the top of the page no matter if you scroll. So right now, I haven't activated it yet. Let's refresh this. And you can see already the change is kind of obvious. The margin on the bottom went away. And as I scroll down, the nav bar comes with me. And the way to do that is just adding nav bar dash fix dash top. Another quick note on the nav bar, usually you will personally define the color using CSS, but if you want to stick to very basics, but you don't like the light color, there's a navbar dash dash inverse class you can add in here, and this will essentially just make it dark and invert the colors. Okay, so that's all I wanted to show right now. Let's take these out. Whoops, come back here. Like I said, let's delete these, the fixed top and also the inverse call save it, refresh, and let's also get rid of all this junk right here, those last paragraphs. So coming back down, I'm going to get rid of what we added here, just so we can focus on the nav bar right now. So refreshing this, I only have my nav bar. Okay, a big thing about nav bars, especially with Bootstrap, and it also has to do a bit with the grid system, is when you collapse it, it actually forms what's known as the hamburger. And if I come back up here to the components page, of the Get Bootstrap site, you can see as I begin to collapse this down, 
I get this little hamburger icon. The reason it's called hamburger is basically you have two buns and a burger. And the one I click that, then I get the rest of the nav bar. But right now, you'll notice that even as I squeeze this browser all the way, I don't get the actual collapse of the burger icon. I just see the actual items beginning to reformat themselves, but I don't get the collapse. So let's show you how you can actually get that collapse in. And to do that, I'm going to delete a lot of, of, a lot of what we already have here. So let's get rid of these divs. And I'm going to copy and paste from the notes and then walk through that. So let's copy and paste what's underneath the collapsible container here. So I just copied and pasted a lot of stuff. So let's walk through it and explain. So as I refresh this, we can see we have this brand link, link and drop down, but the drop down doesn't actually work yet. And we'll explain why in just a second. But expanding this, let's actually show what I copied and pasted here. And this is all from the notes. So here I have my div class navbar header. And we actually had that before. Then I added in a button right here. And basically we have this brand and toggle get grouped for what is essentially a better mobile display. And this is going to be the code that actually creates the hamburger icon. So right now I have this button call and it says class navbar toggle collapsed. So even with this already as a part of my navbar, as I begin to drop down, I can see that it becomes the hamburger icon. If I click on it, nothing happens right now, but I can see that it does collapse now that I've added those lines of code. So hamburger icon, as I expand, I get back the nav bar. But let's explore what's actually going on here. So here's the code for the hamburger icon. And basically what it is, it's a span class that says SR only, toggle navigation. And then we have these three calls for the icon bars. And we can see as I collapse this, I get those three icon bars. I can add in more here. So let's make that four now. And if I refresh this, I can see I actually get four icon bars. And if I keep going with this, add in a bunch more, refresh, I can see I'm adding in more icon bars here. However, it's typical just to use three. So let's save it. So we have three, refresh the page, and we can see we have the three, that little hamburger icon. Okay, so this is the actual code for the hamburger icon. Again, it's just using the class icon bar and then toggle nav navigation. So that's all inside this button where the button class is navbar dash toggle space collapsed. And then there's some more information here that you usually just be copying and pasting. All right, so that's all under the navbar header. And then anything inside of collapse navbar dash collapse goes into the hamburger. And basically what that means is this. So anything, any unordered list that you add in that's inside of a div with this class to it, collapse navbar dash collapse, is going to be collapsed into the hamburger. And to show you what I mean by that is let's add an unordered list outside of that. So I'm going to add in an unordered list. And just like we did last time at the very beginning, we'll give it the class navbar or nav space navbar dash nav. And we'll say something like Hello. So let's save this. And you notice hello here no longer goes into the hamburger. So as, as I expand this, I see brand, hello, link, link, and then a drop down menu. Then as I begin to collapse this, everything that was inside of this div class that had collapse navbar dash collapse went into the hamburger. Whatever was not inside of that, which in this case was this hello, happens to not go into the hamburger and basically details the same behavior we saw last time, where it just gets squeezed down, but doesn't actually go into the hamburger. All right, so that's what that class is doing. And usually you're gonna put almost everything inside the collapse navbar dash collapse, unless it's really so important that you don't want it to go in this hamburger class. But it's really common just to put everything inside the collapse, especially for mobile viewers. The last thing we need to do, however, to actually complete this is if we expand back our menu here and we can refresh this, well, let's save this and then refresh. 
is we see we have the two links and then the drop down menu, but the drop down menu is not working. And we also noticed that when we collapse this, the drop down menu here wasn't working. And that's because we actually need calls to jQuery and JavaScript to make those functionalities work. And the way we're going to do that is in our case, we're just going to copy and paste from the notes. And later on, we'll show you how to actually grab stuff from jQuery. So you can either go to code.jQuery.com to grab this or just copy and paste it from the notes. But what we're going to do in our case is copy and paste this and put it at the very bottom of our body call right here. And what this is doing is it's copying and pasting a script call to jQuery. And this one is copying and pasting the bootstrap JavaScript. And if you went back to the very first page of get JavaScript, you probably noticed that there were some calls there that you could have also copied and pasted. So if bootstrap, when it said download bootstrap, as we scroll down here, we saw that there was minified CSS, but there was also this bootstrap JavaScript. So that's what this second line is right here. This bootstrap JavaScript, that's what I'm copying and pasting from. This other line is code.jQuery.com. That's actually a link to jQuery.js, which we're going to talk about much more later when we talk about jQuery and how it connects to Django. But for right now, you can just copy and paste these two lines from the notes, save this, and then refresh our page. And we should see now that the dropdown menus actually work. So here we have dropdown items. And as we collapse this, we see the hamburger icon. I can click on it, and now everything is working. All right. And if you want more details on how to actually add in more components to the dropdown, you can either check the documentation, which is really good, or just check out the notes. And you can see here that's basically just another unordered list with the class uh, dropdown menu. And then you can add in links, list items there. Okay. Thanks a lot, everybody. If you have any questions, feel free to post them to the Q&A forums. I know this was a lot of stuff, especially with these kind of goofy class names. But all I want you to really get out of this is being able to reference the documentation for nav bars and know what's possible with Bootstrap. Thanks, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello, everyone, and welcome to part four of the Bootstrap section of the course. In this section of the course, we'll discuss Bootstrap's grid system. The grid system for Bootstrap is one of its most fundamental features. So far, we've mostly seen just convenient tools that Bootstrap provides through class calls. And those are things such as calling those button classes in order to make sure they're shaped well, or calling classes on form inputs to make sure the spacing is correct and everything looks nice. But the grid system goes much further than that. The grid system provides the core mechanism by which using Bootstrap allows websites to look good across multiple devices and multiple screen sizes. That's really one of the core purposes of Bootstrap, so that it looks good not just on your desktop, but on your laptop, your tablet, your phone, etc. Let's get started with an explanation of the Bootstrap grid system. So our fundamental question is, what happens when we look at our website on different screen sizes, whether it's on your desktop, your laptop, a tablet, or a phone? How do we reorganize our website so that it looks good across all of these devices? Well, the Bootstrap grid system has this fundamental idea. We'll split the entire screen into 12 available columns that you can see here that are highlighted. You have these 12 basic available columns. Then you can use any combination of numbers that will eventually add up to 12 columns. So on that second row, you see we have six by two columns. On that second example, example number two, we see four by three. Example number three, say three by four, and then we see two by six. So we can split up those two columns in any way we want. And we can also split them up unevenly. So we could say eight on one side and four on the other, or vice versa. The grid system call will make use of the class equal to row. So we're gonna see when we're actually coding out examples, this class is equal to row call. And inside of a row class, we then have the following format. And the format, the general format for a grid system is call dash the screen size dash the number of columns. And the screen size dictates what screen size you're referring to. And there's a few basic screen sizes, and there's actually a little bit of a difference between Bootstrap 3 and Bootstrap 4 in this aspect. But you can think of the screen sizes as basically things such as large, medium, small, extra small. And now with Bootstrap 4, there's extra large. But we'll get into that in just a second. And then that third argument is number of columns. How many columns do you want to take up at this particular screen size? So for example, we have a call like this, col-md-6. And that basically says, 
when the screen size is of a medium screen size, and there's actual pixel amounts to quantitatively define what a medium screen size is, I want this certain thing, whatever's in this container, to take up six columns or half of the available screen. All right, so we can define how the column should be shown when the screen gets resized, and those are basically known as breakpoints. So let's get started with some examples. We're gonna have our browser open. We'll be resizing our browser to see how the columns change as we make the browser bigger or smaller, kind of to emulate different device sizes. And we'll also see how we can account for that with our code. So I'm going to jump to my editor now. Okay, so here I am at my editor, and I have an HTML document open, and it's actually already linked to Bootstrap's CSS file online. First thing I wanna do is actually add in some style calls so I can see the grid system and columns clearly. So one way that we would normally do this is link this HTML document to a CSS file. But I can actually basically put a CSS file inside of this HTML by doing a style tag call. And you don't have to worry about this media screen. We can just take that out. And what we're gonna do is basically just write CSS here. I'm going to make a class called boxy. So I'll have that dot boxy there. And I'm going to give anything in that class a background color of a light blue. So that's a hex code I found here, B3DDFF. So that's kind of a light blue color. And then I wanna give it a border of, let's say, a two pixel solid black border. All right. So we'll see how that comes into play in just a little bit, but that's basically gonna be for visualization purposes. It doesn't have much to do with the actual grid system of Bootstrap. So let's show you an example of using this Bootstrap system for the grids. So I'm going to make a container class, and then I'm going to call a div that has the class row. And we're gonna need that class row to actually do anything inside of a grid system. And then what I will do here is add in some divs inside of this. So I have this class container, class row, and then here I'm going to type col large, let's say large four. And then the class that goes with this is going to be col lg dash four. And this is saying when the screen is a large screen, and so that's a certain amount of pixels, I want this, whatever this is, col large four, to take up four of those 12 columns that are available to me. So I'm going to copy and paste this two more times because I have four plus four is eight plus four is 12. So let's refresh this. And I can see now I have col large four, col large four, and col large four. And to actually see this a little better, what I'm going to do is tack on this boxy class that I just made like this. And so now we can see that we can kind of tack on these classes. And you actually saw that a lot with the navbar lectures, that there was these classes kind of tacked on. But let's refresh this, and now I can clearly see where the columns are. So I have four of the 12 columns taken up here, four of the 12 columns taken up here, four of the 12 here. And this happens at a large screen. But what happens as I begin to expand this screen? Well, nothing happens even at like an extra large size because this basically stands for, for large and above. But what happens if I start shrinking this to below a large screen size? What happens if I hit a medium screen size? Boom. So look what happened here. Suddenly it all collapses and they're all just taking up all 12 columns. So they're all stacked on top of each other now. And that's something we're gonna discover as we go along how we can actually fix this problem well, it's not really a problem, but how we can edit this to do whatever we want. Maybe we still want it to have across the board these three together, even at a smaller screen size. Well, how would I do that? And let's explore through some more examples. So here I have this container class, and let's change this so we actually take up on medium size screens. Well, let's undo this, sorry. Let's copy and paste this whole thing. And let's add in something new right below this. That way we can see them both on top of each other. So I'm going to delete this. And now I'm gonna say, instead of large, I'll type MD for medium. And this will now say MD 
and let's make these guys six. So there's two of them, and we'll call this med six for medium, med six for medium. We will save this. Let's expand this browser, refresh the page. And now I see my original three columns here. So large four, large four, large four, and then two more column calls, medium six, medium six. So each of these is taking up six units of those columns. And now as I begin to shrink this, I can see the collapse once I reach what's known as a medium screen size, the large ones have already collapsed. However, the medium ones are still hanging on to their call there. And it's only until I reach a small screen size that even the mediums now will collapse. So let's continue on this by putting in something smaller to be our class call of the grid system. So I will copy and paste these guys. And now let's put in something like extra small, which is XS. And now I'm going to say extra small here. We're going to say extra small there. Save that. And we're going to expand this again, refresh. And now I can see I have large four, large four, those medium columns, and extra small six. And now let's see what happens as I begin to reach those breakpoints. So here's the breakpoint about to happen for medium. And we can see that medium has not been affected yet. Here's the breakpoint for small about to be reached. And we can see that extra small hasn't been affected yet. So as we keep shrinking this down, we can see that extra small is still going to hang on. In fact, it's going to hang on all the way. So as I make this tiny, this is basically the size of a cell phone string. This is as small as my computer lets me go. Extra small has still contained this two column formation using six of those 12 on this side and six of those 12 on this side. All right, so now the question arises, well, what do I do to account for different screen sizes? It seems like right now, I can only account for one screen size at the very end. Well, you can actually just tack on classes together to make up for that. So let me show you what I mean by that. You can just add in size classes to account for behavior at different sizes. So what I will do now is the following. I'm going to, whoops, let's just delete one of these. And let's have it be col-lg dash three, and we'll call this one. And then instead of just being three units on a large screen, I'm going to have it be six units when it reaches a small screen. And I'm going to copy and paste this, and I'm gonna make four of these. So we'll say one, two, three, four. And let's grab all these and comment them out. So we can just focus on what's happening with this guy. And this is example number four in the notes. So let me expand this, refresh. And here I can say I have one, two, three, and four. And if we look back at my HTML, I said, whenever the screen is large, each of these things should take up three units, which makes sense. They're each taking up three because three times four is 12 here. And then once I reach small or smaller, then they'll each take up six. So what actually happens here? Well, since they're each gonna have to take up six once I reach small, then it gets split. So now one and two are taking up six, and then three and four are taking up six. And then as I continue going, once I reach extra small, they each take up one. So it only gets defined up to the smallest screen size you do. And if you keep breaking past that, it's going to line them all up together to take up all 12. So at this point in the lecture, what I would encourage you to do is really play around with these calls here. And you can reference the documentation either on the new Bootstrap 4, where there's basically an extra large screen size, which you may or may not be able to realize depending on how big your screen is. Or you can just go to getbootstrap.com slash example slash grid to actually see examples of this. So here we can actually see some grid examples. We have the three equal columns on medium. So this is about uh, desktop to large desktops. You can see three unequal columns, so three, six, and three, or two columns, eight and four. 
And there, here are just a bunch of examples that you can do as you explore. So what I would encourage you to do is come to this link, getbootstrap.com slash example slash grid, and actually play with these and see that you really understand how you can define a call as you resize your screen. Okay, so now that we've done that, you may be wondering, well, 12 units is pretty restrictive. What if I want to divide further beyond 12 units? And that's actually really easy. All you have to do is nest those rows calls. So let's comment this out and actually do that. So I'll make a new div. It's going to be a row. And then I'm going to say div, we'll say class is col-lg-6, and we'll tack on the boxy class there. And then inside of this, actually, I'm going to make another div called class row. So here right now I'm only taking up half of the screen on large screens. And then inside of this, I create another class called row. So then I'm going to say div class, this will be call lg6 boxy. And this is where I'll actually put in some content. And we'll call this nest1. And let's make another one just like it. So I'm going to copy this and paste it. And let's call it nest2. And then outside of this row class right here, so inside of this first one, but outside of this, what I'm going to do is the following. And I think I misspoke for a second. So outside of all of this, excuse me. So inside of this first initial row class, but outside of all this, I'm going to call a div and it's going to have the class col-lg-6boxy and let's give it a name like top level. So before we actually see what this looks like, let's explain what's actually going on here. So this is in order to get more than just 12 units. We can divide this further. So I'm calling the initial div class equal to row and that tells Bootstrap, okay, we're gonna be dealing with the grid system here. Then I call a class that says col-lg-6 boxy. Inside of that, where we've been usually just putting in our straight content. In our case, it's been text, but a lot of times it can be images, links, whatever you want to put in there. But inside of that, instead of just putting the content straight away, I add in another class equal to row, which basically means I'm taking up everything inside this, lg-6, and putting in another 12 columns in there to play with. And then I'm splitting that in half. So there's going to be my nest one, nest two, and then there's my top level. So think about what you expect this to look like before you actually view it in your browser. Okay, so hopefully you thought about it. Let's take this, make sure we save it, expand our browser, refresh, and here is what we see. We see nest one and nest two on the left hand side, and then we see top level over on the right hand side. So what we ended up doing was we successfully nested these two in order to split them up. And then we have our top level taking up the rest of it. And that's how you can go further than just these 12 units. You can split up these units again and again using just nested class equal to row calls. Okay, so as a quick review of what we've been discussing, remember the entire idea behind Bootstrap is that this entire screen is split up into those 12 equal columns. And then you can decide based off a of screen size what you want to actually take up out of those 12 columns. So maybe when the screen is large, if we look back at this example, let me uncomment it. So we'll comment this one out and uncomment this one. So this one's probably the best example of how we'd actually use the grid system. So at a large grid size, I would say use three here. But when it reaches small, use six on each of them. And you can change this to whatever you want. So again, the basic idea behind grid systems and bootstrap is you define how many of those 12 columns you want to use at certain screen sizes. And that's basically going to account for the breakpoint. All right, if you have any questions on this, make sure you actually visit the documentation, especially this layout page on the Bootstrap 4 documentation. 
there's a lot more to it than what we've covered. There's like auto layout columns with equal width, and there's a lot more we can do there. We won't be messing around with the grid system too often when we're building our actual websites, which is why we're not going to go into all of this, but it is all there for you. The documentation is pretty clear on what you can and can't do, and it's a really great resource for you. And also check out getbootstrap.com slash example slash grid if you just want ideas for what you can actually do with it. Okay, thanks everyone. Again, feel free to post to the Q&A forums if you have any questions. But other than that, I will see you at the next lecture where we're going to have just a quick project to kind of wrap up everything we've been talking about Bootstrap with. Thanks, and I'll see you there. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Bootstrap project. For this project, you'll be recreating a landing page and a sign-in page that takes advantage of a lot of Bootstrap's features that we've been covering throughout this section of the course. What you should do is open the bootstrap underscore project underscore main.html file in your browser, and it's located under the bootstrap folder. Remember that you can either tackle this project on your own at first, or just follow along with the solutions lecture, whichever you prefer. Let's take a quick look at the project page, what it's about, and then you can decide how you want to approach it. I'm going to hop to my browser now. Okay, so here I have open in my browser the bootstrap underscore project underscore main.html file. And this file actually contains all the instructions that you're going to need. So I would recommend copying the full path to this file and pasting it into your browser and leaving this as instructions you can follow as you create a new HTML file to actually follow along with. All right, so what are we actually doing here? We're creating this coffee lover project for Bootstrap. And what you're going to be doing is recreating this web page and an additional form page. And there's actually all the instructions that you're going to be doing here. So you're going to first create a general landing page of a Jumbotron, as I've done here. Then you're going to create a nav bar on the page that links to another HTML file. So here we can see the welcome nav bar. And if I click sign in, it takes me to another HTML file, which is this project sign up page. So going back here to the landing page, what you're going to be doing is then adding two paragraphs of lorem ipsum to the Jumbotron which we have over here. They're actually outside of the Jumbotron, but you can add them inside the Jumbotron. And next you're going to use the grid system to add in thumbnail pictures of coffee. And I've listed the source of the actual coffee pictures, and there's also image links here. So image link one, if you click on it, it takes you directly to this image. That way you can either download them or just copy and paste this image file path. It's up to you. But again, you're gonna use image tags and then copy in these six pictures of coffee. So here we can kind of think of this as some sort of coffee lover's blog where there's different pictures of coffee. But what's important here is that you're actually going to be discovering a new class of Bootstrap on your own. So this is an actual practice of referencing the documentation for something you haven't done before. And in this case, you're gonna be looking up the thumbnail class for Bootstrap, which is gonna help you a lot actually organize these images and give them this nice little border. Okay. Then after that, you're gonna make sure that the largest settings have three columns of pictures. So here I can see I'm taking up three columns in total. That's four, four, and four, if we think back to the grid system. And then this next row also has three total columns, that means three pictures, four, four, and four out of those 12 columns. And the other requirement is that on the smallest screen setting, you should still have two columns. And it's up to you where you wanna make the change as far as where the actual breakpoint happens. But what I really am concerned about is if we minimize this, so if I shrink this down to the smallest possible size, scroll all the way down here, I still have two columns each. So it's gonna be six and six, six and six, six and six. So keep that in mind, it's one of the requirements that on the largest setting it's three, on the smallest setting it's two. And it's up to you where you wanna actually make the break point. You can have it break at medium, break at small, et cetera, but at extra small it should have those two, and on the largest it should have these three. Okay, then you're gonna create another HTML file for the signup page, and it's gonna be a form with an email, password, and a checkbox. We've actually already seen it, but if you click right here on the sign-in page, we see a little jumbotron here, and it has this email, the password, and the keep me locked in, and submit. All right, so that's it, and I want you to feel free to really play around with this project, style it more to your liking, but the main focuses of this project are adding in a nav bar, adding in the jumbotron, adding in the form on the sign-in page, the container and the grid system. So notice everything here is in a container, that way it's in the middle of the page, and the grid system, along with a thumbnail class you're gonna be discovering on your own here, actually has the pictures of coffee looking nice and organized. Okay, 
Again, totally up to you if you want to attempt these instructions on your own before looking at the solutions lecture, or if you like a more laid back tutorial style, then just skip doing it on your own and follow along with the solutions lecture that's coming up next. Okay, if you have any questions, feel free to post them to the Q&A forums, and I'm happy to help you out. Thanks everybody, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome back. In this lecture, we'll be coding through the solutions for the Coffee Lover Bootstrap project that I explained in the previous lecture. Let's jump to our editor and browser and get started. Okay, so here I have my browser open. Just as a quick reminder, what we're going to do is create this Jumbotron, add some content to the Jumbotron, have these two paragraphs here, these lower mipsums, add the pictures of the coffee, use the thumbnail class, and then make sure that we have the nav bar, and then if I click on the sign in, it takes me to the form. We also want to make sure that we get the grid system right when we're actually adding these thumbnails of the coffee pictures. And we have the links to these coffee pictures right here on these links right here. So one, two, three, takes you to images of coffee. Okay, let's get started. All right, so I have my editor here open with my browser behind it. I've opened up a new project.html file. So I'm going to just link to it now. So I've copied its full path and I'm going to paste it here into my browser. So right now it's blank. Let's add in some HTML code. Let's call the title of it project. And let's also add the link we're going to need for Bootstrap itself. So I'm just going to copy and paste that from the website. I already have it open on another window on another screen. So I save that and then let's add in just the heading here to make sure everything's working. We'll say connected, refresh over here, and I can see I'm connected. So the first thing we want to take care of is probably the nav bar, since we know that's going to be just here on the top of the page. All we have to do for that is add in nav. And remember, we have a class here, and it's going to be nav bar. And I'm going to also add in nav bar dot or dash inverse, which is going to allow us to have that darker color here refresh that and I can say I have my nav bar inverse. It doesn't have anything inside of it yet so let's add in those things. In our case it's just one other item so what we'll end up doing is putting an unordered list in there and we can give it the class nav bar dash nav and before that it's actually nav space nav bar dash nav and then the list item I want here is an anchor tag with an H reference of my signup page. And I've called my signup page that I'm working with right now new underscore signup dot HTML. And this is going to say sign in. Let's save that, refresh. And I can see here I have sign in. But notice here I also have this welcome. So let's add that in as well. And that's going to be a brand. So let's put that in which means it's going to be underneath the nav tag. I'll create a div and this one takes nav bar dash header. And again, I don't expect you to memorize these, just be able to reference the documentation for what you need. And then we'll put an anchor tag here, the class it's going to have is the nav bar dash brand. And the href we want it to have is just the hashtag. And we'll say something like welcome. Let's refresh, make sure it got in there. And there's our welcome and there's our sign in. If I click sign in, it takes me to the new sign up. All right. Looks like our nav bar is working as we want it to work. If we come back here to the bootstrap project, it's a little bigger here than what we have here. But that's actually because I'm zoomed in on this page. So if I zoom in on this page, we'll get the same size. So you can see here I have the little plus thing. If I just actually reset the default, I'll get the same size that I have on this screen. Okay, so our nav bar is taken care of. If I click sign in, it takes me to that new sign up page. Let's actually just copy and paste this code that we have so far and put it on the new sign up page. In fact, I'm gonna copy this entire page, put it on my new sign up HTML page, and then instead of taking it to sign in, I'm going to change this to landing page and then have it take me to the original HTML, which is new underscore project. We'll save that, refresh over here, 
And now I have this link to the landing page on my sign up page. And then I click sign in, takes me to the landing page, and you can see how it's uh, changing it back and forth. Okay, great. So let's come back to our main new project.html page. Check out the Bootstrap project. We still need to add in this Jumbotron. So let's go ahead and do that. First thing I want to do is put it all in a container. So I have that div with the container class. And then what I'll end up doing is putting in the Jumbotron here. So I'll say div, put in the Jumbotron. And then we'll say h1 coffee lover project. And then let's just add in some paragraphs of Laura Mipsum here, just so we have a little bit of content on the page. We'll save that, refresh our project, and we can see here we have coffee lover project, Laura Mipsum, Laura Mipsum. So if we come back to Bootstrap project. We've created a general landing page with a Jumbotron. We created a nav bar on the page that links with the other HTML. We added two paragraphs of Laura Ipsum to the Jumbotron. And next, we need to use the grid system to add in the thumbnail pictures of coffee. And we have all those links right here, one, two, three, four, five, six. So coming back down, I'm going to need to add in those pictures. So how do I actually do that? Well, since I want to take advantage of the grid system for the resizing of that, I want to make sure that it's in a container and then in a row. So I'll create a new div have it be container. I could have also just put it in here in this container, but sometimes it's nice to separate out your code this way. We'll put heading two and have it say pictures of coffee. And then I'll manually code out the first actual row and then we'll just copy and paste for the rest of them. So the next div I want is the row class. And then here I'll make another div and let's put this all on one line. And remember, I want it to be at least three columns of pictures across on the largest setting. So if I expand this, I see three pictures across in the largest setting. And on the smallest setting, it should just be two pictures. So you can see the pictures actually get smaller to adjust for that as I go on. So expanding this again, three, and at the smallest, it's going to be two. So no matter how small it gets, it's always two pictures across. No matter how big it gets, it's always three pictures across, which means I want something like this. I want call on large. I want each picture to take up four units out of those 12 units because four times three is 12. And then at the very smallest, call extra small, I want it to take six units. So six times two is 12. And then the next thing I want to do is add in the thumbnail class. And the thumbnail class allows us to actually make these pictures into thumbnails. And let's explore what that looks like in the documentation. Coming to getbootstrap.com, I can click on the components. And over here on the right hand side, I'll see and look down that there's thumbnails. So clicking on that, I see I can extend Bootstrap's grid system with the thumbnail component to easily display grids of images, videos, text, and more. And this is kind of going to look like almost like Pinterest style photos. And they show you an example here of what these actually look like. But the main thing to notice is that all we have to do is say class thumbnail. And what thumbnail allows you to do is actually expand the call to the class on the outside. So by default, Bootstrap's thumbnails are designed to showcase linked images with some minimal required markup. And then you can also put in custom content, which we won't be doing here. But you can see that I could even add in this little heading, some paragraph statements, and then some buttons as well. So those are two examples of uh, what thumbnails look like. Basically, all you had to do was add in the thumbnail class. So coming back to our project, we're going to add in here a thumbnail. And then we're going to add an image tag right here. And we want to make sure that our source matches up to the coffee picture. And all those coffee picture sources are available to you here on the Bootstrap. So you can click on one of them, and it'll take you to this link right here. So I can just copy and paste this link and then put it as the source of my image, save this, and then if I refresh my project, I can begin to see the first picture of my coffee. So now, instead of just repeating those steps over and over again, I'm going to copy and paste all of these from the solutions, because it's basically just duplicate over and over again. So I copy and paste these. Let's shift tab over, and I can see here, 
I have everything the same, it's just linking to different images that I had on the solution. So let's save that, refresh over here, and now I can see I have my pictures of coffee, three across, three across, everything's looking good. Okay, now that's actually all I really needed for the project itself as far as the main signup page. The only thing I have to check now is if I begin to decrease this, it turns into two columns, which we see it eventually does. Great, even as it gets smaller, it always stays two. Now I just need to fix the signup page, which is currently blank right now. So let's do that. Let me click open my new signup page, which is right here, new underscore signup HTML. It only has the nav bar right now, so we need to add in the forms. If we take a look at what the solutions looked like, so coming back here, clicking on sign in, I can see there's actually a large jumbotron saying to log in, enter your email and password. So let's add that in to our signup page. It's gonna come outside of this nav. I'm going to say, whoops, div, put in a container, another div with the jumbotron itself. And then I'm going to just put in heading one, log in, and then the paragraph is going to say, enter your email and password. So let's save that, make sure it actually registered with our site. Refresh, great. So there's the login, enter your email and password. Now it's time to just add in the form. So I'll say form, and there's an action here, index.html. We really don't need to worry about any action because we're not actually going to lead anywhere and we don't need to worry about the method. If we wanted this to lead somewhere else to another page on the back end, we could have filled that in, but we don't need to worry about that. The class, however, we do need to worry about. So we'll say form dash group. Remember, that's the class we've been working with for bootstrap forms. And then I want to add in a label and an input. First one is going to be my email input and we're going to give this class form-control. Remember the two main classes we were working with when we were working with inputs and forms, it was form group and form control. And then the label I want for this is email, and I wanna make sure this has a name, so we'll give it a name user em for user email, and make sure we assign it this label, user em. Now we don't need to actually give it a value. Instead, let's give it a placeholder and we'll say email just so it looks a little nicer. Let's save that, make sure it worked. We'll refresh. Great, here's our email, but notice it's going all the way across, so it's actually not in a container class, which means I need to come back here and either put it back into this original container or create a new container. It's up to you, depending on how you want to organize your code but I'll just put it in a new container. So let's grab this form, put it in that new container, refresh, and here we have it in a nice container. Okay, so we have our email looking nice with the container. Let's come back up here and actually add in to our form the password, the checkbox, and the submit button. So this will look really similar for the password, so I can actually just copy this, paste it in here, and change the things I need to change. So for instance, I want to change the actual label to say password, and I'll also change for, instead of user em, I'll say user pass, which means I need to change this name over here to user pass. I also need to change the type to password. I'll keep class form control the same, and then placeholder, we're going to say password here. Let's save this, refresh, make sure it all worked. And there's our email, there's our password, looking good. Now let's add in that checkbox. Remember that checkbox just said something like, uh, keep me logged in. So I'll create a div, and we'll give it the class checkbox. We'll call a label. We'll say it's for user check. We'll say keep me logged in, doesn't matter if we capitalize everything, and then I want the input to be a checkbox input with the name user check. 
let's save that and see what we get when I refresh this. So it says keep me logged in, but note that it's actually on top of my checkbox. So let's fix that. The way I fix that is by actually putting in my label wrapped around the input. So I'm going to grab this input over here and make sure I call it in the correct form. So I'm going to pass it in before the keep me logged in. So now let's save this, refresh, and I can see here, now I have my checkbox before the actual label keep me logged in. So again, the way I did that, if I expand this window, scroll to the left here, is I called the label, said input type, and then had the text keep me logged in and closed off that label. Then I just want to add in the submit button. So I will call button type is going to be submit. We could have also said input, it's up to you. And let's give it the class btn, btn default. And that's just something you can reference off the documentation depending on what you want it to actually look like. You could have styled it as a success button or a primary, it's really up to you. If we refresh this, we can see now we have this button here. However, it doesn't actually have anything in it. So let's add in something like submit, save it, refresh, and here we see submit. And now our website's looking pretty good. So if we come back to the landing page, we see Coffee Lover Project, the pictures of the coffee, coming to the sign in, we see our login. I can put in an email and I can put in a password, select to keep me logged in, and submit. All right, that's really all you had to do for this project. Um, I know it can seem really intimidating at first when you see this version of the project, the actual official one. So everything with the instructions, but hopefully you saw from what we learned here in the solutions video that it's actually pretty straightforward. Um, we didn't even reference the documentation that much for what we had to do. A lot of it was just covered in the videos. Now, I know some things such as remembering what these classes are, such as form group or form control, uh, may seem tedious at this point in time, but these are things you're going to be using often enough when you're working with Bootstrap that you'll actually remember them. Um, and I know I keep saying that you'll reference the documentation a lot, but even for simple things like this, which is actually a pretty good looking landing page, um, you don't have to reference documentation that much with the amount of practice you're going to be getting with Bootstrap in this course. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed the project. I will see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to JavaScript Level 1. Welcome to the first JavaScript section of the course. This section will begin to build our understanding of adding interactive functionality to our websites. And JavaScript support is actually built directly into most modern web browsers. That means we can run JavaScript directly into the browser console or as a full.js script that we connect to an HTML file, which means there's nothing to download right now. JavaScript is also a full programming language, meaning unlike HTML or CSS, it supports things such as arrays, loops, and general logic. We will briefly cover major programming concepts as we encounter them with JavaScript. Eventually, we're going to be showing you how to use JavaScript to directly change the HTML or CSS shown on a page. And we're really going to touch on that topic in the Document Object Model or DOM or DOM section of the course. To begin with, however, we're going to be focusing on just the JavaScript basics all by itself. Okay, so we're going to start off with JavaScript just straight in the browser console, and later on we'll show you how to connect full.js scripts to an HTML file. All the code used in this section can be found as .js scripts under the JavaScript level 1 folder. Let's get started. I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to part one, JavaScript basics. In this lecture, we're going to be going to our browser, Google Chrome, and then opening up our console and walking through just the very basics of JavaScript, things such as basic data types and a few basic methods. I'm going to jump to my browser now to get started. Okay, here I am at my browser. I'm just at a new empty tab and I've also gone incognito to make sure I don't get any JavaScript alerts if I'm logged into Gmail. And I would suggest you do the same if you're using a Gmail account. But what you're going to do is anywhere on the page, right click, and then go all the way down to where it says inspect. Click on that. And you should see something like this, probably not as zoomed in as mine, 
So you'll, more likely you'll see something that looks like this. Then you can click on console and you should see the console here for your browser. And this is where we can directly type in JavaScript code and see how the browser interprets it and executes it. Let's start off with the hello world of JavaScript, which is an alert. So we call alert, which is a function, and then you pass in a string. So a string is going to start off with a set of quotes. Here we have double quotes and then whatever string you want to do. So in our case, it's going to be something like hello world. And you can see I've actually typed this before, which is why the JavaScript console is kind of helping me out there. But I'm going to hit enter and we should see a little pop up. And here at the top of the page, I see new tab says hello world. And there's a little click here that says prevent this page from creating additional dialogues. Uh, do not check that box, otherwise you won't be able to see any more of your alerts. So then click OK. And we get undefined here, and we'll be explaining a lot more about function input and output and how that all works. For now, congratulations, you've written your very first line of JavaScript code. Let's continue on by talking about basic data types. So first, before we actually start that, I want to show you how you can write a comment in JavaScript. And a comment in JavaScript is just two forward slashes, and then anything beyond this, so anything here is a comment. And if I hit enter here, basically nothing's going to be executed because that was all a comment. So right now let's start off with basic data types. Okay, the first basic data type are numbers. And numbers can be integers, such as 10. Floating point numbers, maybe like 20.2, which means it has a decimal and even things like negative numbers, so negative 13.4 or something. Note that JavaScript, unlike some other languages, treat, treats these all the same as numbers. So regardless if it's a floating point of a decimal, a whole integer, or a negative number, they all are treated as numbers in JavaScript. There's no distinction between them. At least for our very basic use cases, we don't need to worry about that. Then next, there are strings. So strings are basically strings wrapped in quotes. So we've already seen one. We've seen hello world. So here we have the string hello world and it gets output. And then we can also even wrap digits, but note here the difference. If I wrap this number 10 in quotes, it now becomes a string instead of an actual number. And we'll talk a lot more also about how JavaScript compares strings like this to a number like this. It's unlike some other languages. So we'll have to keep an eye out for that. Okay, so those are strings. And up next, I wanna show you Booleans. So if you haven't encountered Booleans from other programming languages, they're basically logical values that can stand for true or false. And in JavaScript, it's the lowercase true or all lowercase false. And those are the Booleans. And there's two more things I wanna show you, which are undefined and null. And we'll talk again a lot more about these in a future lecture, but I just want you to be aware that undefined and null are not exactly the same thing, but they are available as basic data types in JavaScript. Okay, let's take a step back and focus in on numbers. So those were over here in blue syntax highlighting numbers. And we can actually use JavaScript as a basic calculator. But before we do that, I wanna show you how you can clear your console. To clear your console, just type in clear and then close parentheses at the end of that. Hit enter and the console will be cleared for you. Okay, so JavaScript as a basic calculator can do addition. So I can say things like two plus two and you see it responds four. I can do subtraction, five minus one, multiplication, three times two, that's an asterisk for multiplication there. I can do division, for instance, 10 divided by two gives me five. And note what happens if I do two divided by five, it gives me 0 0.4. Other programming languages sometimes won't actually give you the decimal amount. JavaScript does do true division here. So two divided by five does give you the correct answer of 0 0.4. Then if we want to do exponents, that's two sets of asterisks. So for instance, if I want to do two to the power of four, that's going to be asterisk asterisk four. And then that equals 16, which is two times two times two times two, or two to the power of four. And then the last mathematical operation, which you may or may not be familiar with, depending how new you are to programming, is what's known as the modulo or mod function, or really operation, it's not really a function. 
And basically what this does is it returns the remainder of a division. So for example, if I say 15 divided by 14 and hit enter, I get 1.07, et cetera, some very large decimal. But if I were to think about this in terms of remainder, I would know that 15 divided by 14 is 14 remainder one. Now, if I wanted some mathematical operation to only return that remainder, that can be shown as the mod operation or the modulo operation, which in most program, programming languages, it's shown as a percent sign. So 15 mod 14 returns one because it's 14 remainder one. Let's show you another example. For instance, six mod two returns zero. And that's because two goes into six evenly three times. So three remainder zero. Now, if I do something like six mod four, I get remainder two because it's going to be four remainder two to get six. So again, this mod function, this mod operation just gives you back the remainder. Okay, so we discussed numbers and how to treat JavaScript using a basic calculator. Let's clear our console again. And now let's talk about strings and some very basic operations that you can do with strings for JavaScript. So strings are just sequences of characters and each element or character has an indexed position. So let's start with a string that just says Django is cool. And I can actually concatenate strings together and concatenate means just bring together. So I can say something like Django and I concatenate with plus is super cool. Hit enter and then I see Django is super cool. But look what happened here. On that concatenation, there's no space between Django and is because there was no space at the end of Django or at the beginning of is there. So I'm, if I wanna concatenate these two strings to make sense, I can put a space there before is and then when I concatenate those two together, but with the plus sign, I see Django is super cool. So far, pretty basic stuff. If I wanna grab the actual length of a string, I call the length attribute. So I say something like Django and then call dot length off of that string. And you can see that the console actually helps you out with some autocomplete. And then here I can see there are six elements or six characters in this sequence, which is the string. One, two, three, four, five, six, great. And then we can also check if white space counts by saying something like x space x dot length, and you see we get three. So white space also counts. It's going to count those spaces. Now there's also escape characters and strings that are really common. For example, if I say something like hello backslash n, start a new line, and then hit enter here, I can see that this special escape character stands for beginning a new line. So hello, and then I start a new line with backslash n, and then everything else goes on a new line. Another escape character is tab. So I can say hello backslash t for tab. Give me a tab. And this will insert a tab, essentially just four spaces there. And then finally, I can also do quotes. So I can say hello, and then I will say quotes backslash hit enter. And this is just a way to input quotes inside of a JavaScript string. So let me make that probably a little more clear by not using the word quotes there, but it's a backslash quote. And then I can say something like jelly. And I can see that the double quote is now inside the string. And the reason you would need an escape character is if you didn't have that backslash there for the escape, JavaScript would think that you wanted to just end the actual string right there at that first double quote. But instead, if you want to escape it and actually have quotes inside, you can use that escape character. So that's useful if you're trying to say something like, she said, quote, blah, 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 end quote, and then finish off the string. All right. Then finally, I want to talk about actually indexing individual characters or elements. So indexing starts at zero. So if I have hello and I want to grab a certain character off of that string based off of its index location, for instance, I want to grab H 
Well, that starts at index zero. So if I do hello, and then with square brackets and put a zero there, I get h back. Okay, before we continue on, let's see a few more examples of indexing with a string. So if I have a string again, hello, and I wanna grab the letter O from this, well, I just have to count starting with index zero. So this is gonna be H is zero, E is one, the first L is two, the second L is three, and then the O is at index four. And there it returns O. And we're gonna learn a lot more about indexing strings later on, but what I want you to do is take a random string, maybe something like look at the dog, and then see if you can, through indexing calls, grab the letter D from this. So pause the video, see what number you have to provide to grab the letter D, just to practice. Okay, so hopefully you're able to get it. Let's see, it's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and there's the letter D. Okay, now let's continue on by talking about variables. I'm going to clear the console, and let's talk about variables in JavaScript. So the general form of variables in JavaScript looks something like this. You say the keyword var, then you have the variable name, and then you're going to say it's equal to whatever you want the actual value to be, and then a semicolon to let JavaScript know that you're done. And JavaScript is actually really flexible these days on what has to end with a semicolon and what doesn't have to end with a semicolon. For almost all things now, you actually don't need the semicolon anymore, but we'll keep putting it into place and we'll talk about it a little more in a future lecture. But that's the very basic format, so let's actually get some practice. I'm going to make a variable called bank account. And unlike some other programming languages, JavaScript uses camel case. And what camel case means is if you have multiple words in a variable name, the next word that you put in is going to have a capital letter. So we see bank, next word has a capital letter. And if I wanted to add something else to this, maybe the city it was in, I would then put another capital letter, put another capital letter, etc. So that's what it looks like. So we have bank account. And then I'm going to say is equal to 100 semicolon. So now I have a variable bank account, which means if I actually call bank account, I'll get back the number or value I assigned to it. So then let's make a variable called deposit. And we'll set it equal to 50. And now let's actually do some logic with this. So I will say variable total is equal to my account plus my deposit. And it looks like it needs to be my bank account. So sorry about that. Bank account plus deposit. There it is. So we saw we had an error here. Account is not defined because I never defined something called account. I only defined something called bank account. So now here I see variable total is equal to bank account plus deposit. So if I show my total, I get 150, 100 plus 50. Okay, so let's show a couple more examples of variables. I'm going to clear my console. Let's say I create a variable called greeting, and this one's gonna be a string now. I'll say something like, welcome back, colon, and then I'm going to make another variable called name, and you should go ahead and input your name here. I'll put in Jose, and then we're going to say an alert. So we should see a prompt come up. And I'm gonna do greeting, plus, remember we can concatenate strings, name. Hit enter and now I see it says welcome back Jose on the very top here. Great. So if I get a variable such as VAR and I don't ever define it, so let's do that, something like my variable and I hit enter, I get undefined. So undefined means you created something but you never actually defined it. A null on the other hand, so for instance if I make a variable called bonus, and assign it to the keyword null, that's going to be actually nothing that you set. And that's really the difference between null and undefined. Undefined means something was created, but it was never actually defined. So this variable exists, but it was never defined in the case of my variable. Null, on the other hand, means that you're actually setting nothing to this variable on purpose. So here, 
we have something that's undefined, created but never defined. In the case of this variable called bonus, we actually assigned it nothing or null. So it is defined as null instead of just being undefined. Now, don't worry too much right now that all of these actions output undefined. That basically just means that there was nothing to output for all the lines of code that we were writing. Now, before we end this lecture, I want to show you just a few basic JavaScript methods that we talked about. We already know alert, but just to reiterate, alert is going to alert and pop up something in the browser. So I will say alert, hey, hit enter, and it alerts up here. And we'll be using those a lot to check our work later on in this section of the course. The other thing I want to show you is actually outputting something to the console. So a lot of the stuff we've been doing has never been outputting things to the console. If I want to output something to the console, I can use console.log and then whatever I want to output. So let's say, hey, I'm in the console. Let's hit enter. We see here it now says, hey, I'm in the console. And that's how you output something to the console. And then finally, we have prompt. So prompt is an actual key. So I will say, let's start off with just prompt. And we'll say, enter something. Hit enter. And at the very top of the page, it'll say, enter something. And here you can just enter whatever, hit OK. And we see the output here. If you want to save this as a variable, you can do something like var age is equal to prompt, and then we'll say enter your age. Hit enter, and up here it says enter your age, so we can enter our age. Let's say we're 90 years old, lived a good life, hit OK. And now it'll say undefined, but if I call age again, it gives me back 90. And note that it gives it back to me as a string. Okay, so we covered a lot here, but it was all the basics. Hopefully this didn't seem too complicated. I know it's a lot of stuff right now, so if you need a review, you can always check out the JavaScript basics.js script that's under the JavaScript level one folder, so you can actually go and practice on your own the various commands that we did in this lecture. Okay, thanks everyone, and I'll see you in the next lecture where we're going to be continuing our discussion of the basics of JavaScript. Hello everyone, and welcome to part two, Connecting JavaScript. We learned quite a bit in the last lecture, so let's take a little bit of a break and just show you how you can connect a JavaScript file, which is a .js extension file, to an HTML file. We're going to open up Atom and the browser for this, so let's hop over to them now. Okay, so here I have Atom Text Editor open, and in the Atom Text Editor, I have two files, an empty HTML file called example.html, and a file called myscript.js, which is also empty at this time. So what I will begin doing is typing out HTML, just so we get some basic HTML here. I'm going to put heading one and say something like, welcome to your bank. Let's save that and check that it's connected to our browser by refreshing the page. And here we see, welcome to your bank. Now let's show you how you can actually connect a JavaScript file to your HTML file. And this works with the script tag. So up here, we can type script. And inside of the script tag, the open tag, I'm going to write src for source, and then actually input the source of my script. And the source for my script is just myscript.js. And it goes in quotes. And then we have a close in tag. So it looks like this. And you can actually use Atom to automate this. So if I begin to type script here and I hit enter, you'll actually get this auto pop up here. You don't have to really worry about type at this point in time. So you could just use that as well for the autocomplete. But basically what we're looking for here is just a script tag where the first open script tag has the SRC or the source and pointing to your .js file. And right now these are both in the same directory. So all I have to do is provide the name. Now let's actually add some stuff to the .js file so we can clarify and check that it's actually working. So the very first thing I'm going to do here is in this JavaScript file, I'll put an alert that says, welcome to your bank. And I will save that. And let's refresh this page. And we should now, upon refreshing, see an alert that says, this page says, 
welcome to your bank, and we'll hit OK. And note over here in the HTML that I'm calling my script before I'm calling anything else in the body. So the reason that this appeared blank for a second is because I was calling my script before I called anything in my body. And we'll discuss later on what script placement and where it should go has an effect on your HTML. But let's continue on with this JavaScript file. We'll continue on with our bank example. I'm going to create a variable called deposit. And that's going to be a prompt saying, how much would you like to deposit today? Question mark. And then let's say alert. You've deposited. And then we're going to concatenate the actual deposit amount. And then I'm also going to do a console log. So I will say console.log and we'll put something like you are a cool person. So let's save that, refresh our page to reload this JavaScript. And now it says, welcome to your bank. We hit OK. And then it says, how much would you like to deposit today? Let's put in 100, click OK. We get an alert. It says, you've deposited 100. Now we also have that console log. So I can check by right clicking, saying inspect, and here on the console, I see you are a cool person. Great. So that's really all there is as far as connecting a JavaScript file to an HTML file. Again, the main thing I want you to get out of this is that there's a script tag and you can connect it to your JavaScript source. And then whatever JavaScript you have here will be uploaded whenever you refresh the page or when you actually just visit the page for the first time. All right. Thanks everyone, and I will see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to part three, your first JavaScript exercise. Let's get some practice with your new skills. You're going to be creating a very simple website that takes in a weight in imperial pounds and converts it to kilograms. The HTML is already done. All your work will just be in the connected.js file. And the relevant files can be found under JavaScript level one folder, and they're called part three underscore exercise.html and part three.js. So at the bottom of that HTML file is the connection to the solution.js file, which is part three.js. Make sure to actually change that to your own.js file before you start. Let's quickly explore the HTML file and what this exercise actually looks like. I'm going to hop over to the editor and browser now. Okay, here I have my editor open as well as the browser connected to the HTML file. And the instructions for the exercise are actually already embedded into this HTML file. Like I mentioned, you're going to be creating a weight metric converter, taking a number in pounds and convert it to kilograms. And what you're going to be doing is at first, you need to grab this HTML file and all the way down at the bottom, we have the script. And the reason the script is at the bottom is because I want all this HTML to load before my script actually loads. So I have this script here, and right now it's connected to my own script, my script.js. But when you first open this file, it's going to be connected to part 3.js. That is the solution JavaScript file. So if you want, you can run this HTML page one time so you can see what the solution looks like as far as its interaction with the website. But make sure when you're actually programming your JavaScript, you remember to change the source to your own solution. Okay, so like I said, you first want to actually change the script here so it links to your work, then use JavaScript to accept a number input in pounds. Then in your J JavaScript file, convert this number to kilograms, and the conversion from pounds to kilograms is right here. You multiply it by 0 0.454, and then afterwards report back in an alert that the weight is now in kilograms, and then log slash write conversion completed to the console. So I can see here, conversion completed in the console. Let me refresh the page and show you what this should all look like once you've come up with your solution. I'll refresh, and we see here it says, what is the weight in pounds? So I'll put in 100 pounds, click OK, and then it reports back that is 45.4 kilograms. I hit OK, and down here at the console, I see conversion completed has been logged. All right, this is a fairly simple exercise. It's actually just a few lines of JavaScript code. If you get stuck on anything, feel free to post the Q&A forums, or just watch the next lecture where I will code through the solutions. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture.
Hello everyone and welcome to the solutions lecture for the first JavaScript exercise in part 3. Let's hop to the editor and get started. Okay, so here I have my text editor of the HTML document open and I've linked it to myscript.js and myscript.js is currently empty. So right now if I refresh this page, nothing actually happens. So let's actually add in the logic that we need to convert this. So I'm going to create a variable lbs for pounds and I'm going to set it equal to the prompt which asks weight in pounds question mark. Then what I'm going to do is create another variable called kilograms or kg which is equal to the variable lbs or pounds times 0 0.454 and then I'm going to alert the user that is, and let's concatenate it with the kilograms, kg plus, and then say kilograms. And note my spacing here, that way it actually reads nicely. And let's add some semicolons here, and we're going to talk more about semicolons later on. It's actually not necessary to have them here on each line, but it's good practice. And then we're going to add in a log to this. So if you just start typing log, you'll actually get the whole console.log there. And I will say conversion complete. So now let's refresh this page and see what happens. It says weight in pounds. I'll say 100 pounds. It tells me it's 45.4 kilograms. I hit OK, and I get conversion complete at the bottom. And that's really all there was to it. So again, just four lines of JavaScript. And hopefully now you feel really comfortable setting a variable using prompt, using alert, and using console.log. If you have any questions, feel free to post the Q&A forums. I'll see you all at the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to part four of JavaScript level one, operators. It's time to learn about comparison and logical operators with JavaScript. And these operators are going to allow us to begin to add logic to our JavaScript code. And as a quick note, there are also five optional quick exercises at the end of this lecture, and you can find them under the part four underscore operators dot JS file that's under the JavaScript level one folder. Okay, let's hop to our console and get started. Okay, so here I have the editor open as well as my browser, and I have the console open in my browser. And remember, you can always just right click, hit inspect, and then go over to the console. And on this left hand side, I have the actual course notes open. So what we're going to be doing is quickly reviewing booleans. Remember, they're all lowercase. It's just true and false. And what we want to do is start off with comparison operators. And comparison operators allow us to compare two items and return a boolean. And I want you to pay special attention to what happens when we actually reach equality and we test if something's equal or not. So we'll start off with the simple ones, which are things such as greater than. So if I check is three greater than two, well, that's true is two greater than three, that's false. So that's greater than, there's also less than, so one less than two, there's greater than or equal to, so is two greater than two, well that's false, but is two greater than or equal to two, that's true. So there's greater than or equal to, and there's also less than or equal to. So we can see here. Let me clear my console to come back up here. And now what I wanna do is take a little bit of time to discuss equality and its special quirk. So let's say I ask is two equals equals two. Well, that returns true. And typically in a lot of languages, this would be how you test for equality. And this would also work for things such as strings. So, so if I have something like user as a string and I check equals equals user, then it returns true. But here's where it gets a little strange. Let's say I have a string called two, and I say equals equals two, and I want to see if this is true or not. If I hit enter on this, JavaScript, unlike a lot of other programming languages, is actually going to report that this is true. And usually you do not want this to be true. You do not want a string two to be equal to the actual number two. So how do we actually take care of this situation? Well, what you end up doing is just adding another equal sign there. So you report back equals 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 two. And this will be now false. So if you want to check equality of not just the actual number here, what it's saying, but of actual type, 
you wanted to use triple equal sign. Okay, so let's take a little bit of time to discuss the real differences between the triple equal sign, which returns false, and the double equal sign, which returns true in this situation. And what's happening when you only use two equal signs is JavaScript is using what's known as type coercion, which basically means it's trying its best to convert both of the objects to similar data types to actually perform the comparison. And a lot of times you don't actually want that. You want to c compare two objects based not just on what they represent to a user, but what they actually represent in the data type space. So one is a string, one is a number, they shouldn't be the same. So the way you do that is you add in that extra equal sign to have three equal signs there. And you actually do the same thing with inequality. So if you want to check inequality, not just the value, but also of data type, you do this. So I want to check is five not equals to five, the string, that ends up being true. So I add the equal sign there. If I only used one equal sign here, then I would have gotten false. So remember, for most use cases, we want to add in that extra equal sign. So we want three equal signs to test for equality, and then an exclamation mark, two equal signs to test for inequality. So here, this is saying that the digit five is truly not equal to the string five. If I only use one of these, in this case, so I don't add that extra equal sign, it'll say something like the digit is actually not not equal to five. And it's a little weird because there's a double negative here, the in, falsely unequal. So just to clarify, you'll always want to use the triple equal signs and then exclamation mark two equal signs for inequality. Okay, so we always want to check for equality and inequality, not just the value, but also of type. So let's talk about a few more situations. It's really common in programming languages for zero and one to be substitutes for true and false. And let me show you what I mean by that. I'm going to clear this, and we can actually scroll down the notes and see what I'm talking about here. If I say true is equal equal to one, I actually get true back. And if I check as true equals 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 to one, I get false back. So this is just a quick note that a lot of times we can see one as far as the type coercion and how JavaScript's trying to get types to compare to each other, I could have also used one to kind of act as true. And the same goes for zero and false. So false equals equals zero, that returns true. But if I'm checking not just for value, but also for data type, then I get false here. Okay, so that's a little bit of a quirky behavior if you haven't seen this before in other programming languages. And there's also a little bit of a weird behavior for null, undefined, and NAN values. So if I check does null equals equals undefined, I end up getting true, which is a little bit strange. And if I use triple equal signs, I get false. So that's just something to keep in mind. And if I say is NAN equals equals to NAN, I actually get false there, which is kind of weird behavior, and we'll be talking a lot more about that later on, but I do want you to be aware of there's some funky behavior when you're checking for equality and you're just doing comparison operators with these null, undefined, and NAN values. So keep that in mind. We'll touch on this later on, but this is just something for you to be aware of. To begin with, a lot of our problems won't even deal with null or undefined values, so don't worry about it too much right now. Let's clear that out and let's begin talking about logical operators. Logical operators just allow us to combine multiple comparison operators. So let's say we wanted to know if one is equal to one, and we also wanted to know if two is equal to two. Well, how could I combine both of those? Typically, you would use an AND operator. And in the case of JavaScript, the AND operator uses two ampersands which is this symbol right here. So here I can check is one equal to one and is two equal to two. In that case, they're both true. So in order for this to return true, both of these statements have to be true. And I can actually tack on more than that. So I could say is one triple equals to one and is two equal to two and 
is one equal to two. And this returns false because while these first two were true, this last one was false. And because they're all ands, they all have to be true. Then if we clear the screen here, we can also use or operators. And or operators are written with what's known as the pipe operator. And they only need one condition to be true to return true. So for instance, is one equal to two? And that's what or looks like, that pipe operator. You usually find it above the enter or shift key on your keyboard. And you just do shift uh, backslash to actually get that pipe operator. But we see is one equal to two or is one equal to one. And that's true because only one of these conditions had to be true. And then we also have the not operator. So not operator, that's not as common to use, no pun intended there, but let's also check it out. It's basically a way of checking the opposite of a condition. So for instance, I'll put this in parentheses. If I wanna check is one equal to one, well, that's true. What if I wanna check if the opposite is true? Well, then I can add an exclamation point in front of this to check. So this exclamation mark will return the opposite of whatever is in here and the opposite of true is false. So when I hit enter, I should see false there. So it's again, it's basically a way of checking the opposite of a condition. And you can also stack these. So you can do exclamation mark, exclamation mark, one equals equals one. But this is definitely not that common to use. And hopefully you never see just a bunch of exclamation marks like this because really this kind of makes no sense and this is just bad code, but it is functional code. Okay. So that's really all there is to discuss about comparison operators and logical operators. For the most part, they're pretty straightforward. The only things I really want you to pay attention to is the use of this triple equal sign versus just the double equal sign. And I want you throughout the course to be extra vigilant about that, especially when you're working with JavaScript. And I also want you to be aware of this kind of weird behavior with null, undefined, and NAN. We won't run into this that often throughout this course, but I do want you to be aware of it. And then scrolling back down all the way to the bottom of the notes, we have some exercises here. So let me just expand this and show you. So here are a few, there's five quick exercise questions for you. And what I want you to do is knowing that X is equal to one and Y is equal to two, mentally evaluate these expressions right here. So there's five expressions for you to mentally evaluate them. Once you think you know the answer in your head, just copy and paste this line to the console to actually see if you're correct. So let's do the first one together and then I'll let you do the other four on your own. So if X is equal to one and Y is equal to two, let's see what we have here. On this left hand side, I see is the string two equals equals to the number two. Well, we learned previously that doubles equal sign instead of triple equal sign will only check for the value, not the actual data type. So I know this side is true. And then I say, and is x triple equals to one. So that's checking both for value and data type. Well, I know that the number one is equal to the number one. So I believe that exercise one should return true since both sides of this and statement are true. Let's check it out. I'm going to copy this and paste it into my console. So I have those two variables and now let's copy and paste this line, put it into my console. And it looks like I was correct, we got true. Okay, so that's basically all I want you to do, mentally evaluate the other four here, and you can check your own solutions against the console commands. Okay, thanks everyone. If you have any questions, feel free to post the Q&A forums. I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to part five, Control Flow. Control Flow is a fundamental aspect of any full programming language and it allows us to execute code only if a certain situation or condition arises. And we can use it in combination with logical and comparison operators. In case this is your first time programming, we're going to briefly go over the main concepts of control flow, such as if statements, else statements, and else if statements in this lecture. If you've already programmed in another language before, you may actually find it more useful just to reference the notes for this lecture to get the JavaScript syntax, since a lot of these concepts are the same across programming languages. The only thing that's different is the actual syntax. So let's continue on and actually discuss control flow. So usually when you're dealing with control flow, you're going to initiate some sort of condition check 
that returns a Boolean, which is either true or false. And then based off those results, you use control flow to execute a specific block of code. Let's see the first basic example, which is an if statement. So an if statement, the general syntax looks like this. You say if, and then some condition. And that condition right there is usually some sort of comparison operator, or you're checking for some sort of equality. So we say if this condition is true, we execute some code that's inside those curly brackets. So the syntax is if, in parentheses, the condition check, and then in curly brackets, you're going to execute some sort of code. Then there's the if else statement. And the main logic behind this is if some condition is true, you execute some code, that very first line there. Else, meaning if that condition was not true, you execute some other code. So here we're just checking if a condition is true, we execute some code. If it doesn't happen to be true, then the else statement occurs and we execute some other code. And then we have the if, else if, and else statements. So if you want to check for multiple conditions, not just one, you can add an else if statement. So the syntax looks like this. We say if, you check for some condition number one, you execute some code. Then you can have an else if to check for another possible condition. And then you execute some other code. If condition one and condition two don't bring up true, so neither of those conditions happen to be true, then finally the else block executes some backup code. Okay, let's actually code through some examples. That was just general syntax and a very high level overview. But I think if we code through some examples, it'll make it a lot clearer. I'm going to open up my editor in my browser now. All right, so here I have an HTML file open and a JavaScript file open. They're both blank and my browser is connected right now to that HTML file. So let's actually fill in this HTML file and then also connect it to the script. So I'm going to write script. I can get rid of that and just say the source is my script.js. Okay, and let's make sure this is working by adding some sort of alert here that says, hello, save this, I'll refresh my page, and I get the alert, hello. Great, so we're connected to the JavaScript. That way, if I wanna run more than one line of JavaScript code, all I have to do is type it to this .js file and then refresh my browser over here. And let's actually open up the console here as well. So I'm going to say inspect, hit the console, and now I can see output. So to begin seeing an if statement in action, we're going to start by creating two variables. First, we'll create hot, and we'll say it's false. And then I'll create another variable called temp, and I will say it's equal to 60. And what we're going to do is just apply some very simple logic code. So we say if some condition is true, then we execute the code inside of those curly brackets. So for example, we have these two variables, hot and temp, and imagine that hot starts off as false and temperature or temp is some number in degrees. And if the temp is greater than 80, we want to assign hot is equal to true. So if it's more than 80 degrees, I'm going to say that it, it, hot is now true. So what does this look like? Well, I can say if, and I can actually hit enter here, and Adam will automatically fill in that sort of syntax scaffolding. And the most basic if statement is just if true. So let's run this one first. I'm going to say if true, I will log I ran. Refresh the page here, and it says I ran. So that's the very most basic if statement, if true, and then this always runs because it will always be true. Let's show you something a little more realistic using those two variables. I'll say if the temperature is greater than 80, log temp is greater than 80. We'll save that, refresh our page, and now we actually don't get any output, which makes sense because remember, temperature is 60. But now let's do this. If temperature is greater than 80, I will say hot, is equal to true. And this is actually the first time we show this, but this is how you can reassign a variable in JavaScript. So right now I initiated it with the VAR call. So this is for initializing that variable, but if I just want to reassign it, I have to make sure it's reassigned to the same data type here. So it's also a Boolean, but in this case, I'm reassigning it to true. And then I'm going to log hot. So let's see what happens. If I refresh this page, I get false. So what actually happened here? Well, I have my variable, hot is equal to false, the temperature is 60. 
I said if the temperature is greater than 80, reassign hot to be true, and then finally output hot. Since temperature was not greater than 80, this reassignment never occurred, meaning hot is always going to stay false. Now let's try this again, but set the temperature to be higher than 80. 100. So take a moment and think what we'll see when I actually refresh this page. Will it be false or true? I'm going to refresh, and it's true, which makes sense because the temperature is now 100, meaning if the temperature is greater than 80, 100 is greater than 80, reassign hot to be equal to true, and then log whatever hot currently is, and hot was reassigned to true. And that's the very basics of an if statement. Now let's imagine that we want to execute another block that occurs if the if statement is false. Well, in that case, we can use an else statement to do this. Let's add that in. So I'm going to say just console log up here. Console log hot outside. So if the temperature is greater than 80, I'm going to say it's hot outside. Else, and you can see that Adam's helping me out here, so I'll just take its help. Else, I will log it's not very hot today. And you might be wondering, hey, why doesn't else actually have this parentheses check here? And the reason is because else doesn't need to check for any specific condition. Remember, else is going to occur only if all the conditions above it never were activated. They were never true. Okay, so let's try this again. I'm going to delete this line right here, and I'm going to set temperature equal to 100. So let's think what's going to log if I set temperature equal to 100. I'll refresh this page, and it says it's hot outside. So that makes sense. If the temperature is greater than 80, log it's hot outside. Now let's set the temperature to be 50 degrees. What do we think is going to happen when I refresh the page? It's not very hot today. That makes sense because this if statement was never triggered as true, meaning this else statement is going to occur. It's not very hot today. And that's the basics of an if else statement. Okay, so we saw how if statements work, how if else statements work. Now let's see how else if statements work. So again, if we want to check more conditions than just one single condition and its opposite, we can add else if statements to check for multiple specific conditions. And the way it looks is like this. And you can see that Adam text editor will actually help us out. And we see else if, I'll hit enter. And it makes sense that there's parentheses here now because I want to check if another certain condition is true. So let's actually check for multiple temperature ranges. So right now, if the temperature is greater than 80 degrees, I say it's hot outside. Now let's imagine that it's just pretty average or nice outside. So the temperature is less than or equal to 80. And the temperature is greater than or equal to 50 degrees. So somewhere in between 50 and 80, I'll say average temp outside. Now let's check for another condition. Again, we'll call else if, and inside this parentheses, I'll put in another condition, something like temperature less than 50, and temperature greater than or equal to 32 degrees. I'll log that it's pretty cold out. And then finally, I'm going to want an else statement. And for this else statement, I'm going to say it is very cold out. And the reason for that is because I know the else statement is only going to occur if the temperature is not greater than 80, it's not in between 80 and 50, and it's not in between 32 and 50, meaning else statement is only going to occur when the temperature is less than 32 degrees. So let's try this out and make sure we got everything right. I'm going to refresh my page here. Remember, our starting temperature is 50 degrees. So if I refresh this, I would expect it to say average temp outside because we fall right here. Temperature is equal to 50. Let's make average temp outside go again with something like 70 degrees. Save this, refresh, and there it is again, average temperature outside. Let's make it say it's pretty cold out. So I'll say it's 40 degrees outside. Refresh, and it says it's pretty cold out. And now let's make it something like 10 degrees. If I refresh this page, then it says it is very cold out. 
meaning none of these conditions were actually activated, so the else statement was activated. Okay, let's do one final example of comparison operators. So I will delete all this, and let's start with kind of a store example. So I'll make a variable called ham, set it equal to 10, whoops, variable called ham, set it equal to 10, and then I'll create another variable called cheese, and set it equal to 10. And we'll discuss semicolons later on. You don't actually need those there, so don't worry about having semicolons everywhere right now. But let's say we want to report back to headquarters what our ham and cheese sales were. We run a little store that sells ham and cheese. So I'm going to make my variable report equal to a string that's just blank right now. And then I'll start off with my first if statement, and I will say if the sales of ham is greater than 10, greater than or equal to 10, and cheese is greater than or equal to 10, I'm going to say my report is equal to strong sales of both ham and cheese. Then let's have an else if statement. And the else if statement is going to say else if ham is equal to zero and cheese is equal to zero. My report is going to be equal to nothing sold. And let's keep things simple with an else statement and I will say report is equal to we had some sales of items. And you can keep adding else if statements for things like if you only sold ham or you only sold cheese that day, what would it look like? But at the end of this, outside of these if statements, I'm going to say log or console.log, and I will log my report. So let's refresh this and see what we get. So it says strong sales of both ham and cheese. That makes sense. Ham and cheese are both 10 right now. Let's say ham is 1. We'll refresh this page. We had some sales of items. That makes sense. And let's change it so that nothing was sold. Ham is equal to 0, and cheese is equal to 0. Refresh our page, and it says nothing sold. OK, great. Hopefully now you have a general understanding of if statements, if else statements, and else if statements in JavaScript. Coming up next, we're going to begin discussing loops with the while loop. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to part six, while loops. So let's learn a bit about while loops in JavaScript. And loops in general allow us to automatically repeat blocks of code. And the while loop will continually execute code as long as the condition remains true. And like I mentioned for the previous lecture, if you're already familiar with while loops from another programming language, you may just want to check the notes for this lecture and just reference the syntax changes yourself. OK, in case you're new to a while loop, let's see what it actually looks like. So in JavaScript, the while loop looks like this. You say the keyword while, and then in parentheses, you have some sort of condition. And then inside the curly brackets, you execute some code, and that code is going to be continually executed while that condition is true. And something to be careful with while loops is if you have a condition that will always remain true no matter what, then that while loop will execute forever. And that may lead to buggy code because your while loop just never breaks, it always stays running forever. Okay, let's see some actual examples, and we're also going to learn about a few keywords, such as the break keyword, which will break out of a top-level block of code. Let's jump to our editor to get started. Okay, so just like last time, I have an HTML script that's connected to my JavaScript, this myscript.js, and that, in turn, has the HTML connected to this browser. So let's get started with a very simple while loop example. I'm going to create a variable called x, and set it equal to zero. And then I can begin typing while, hit enter, and Adam helps me out with the rest of the context. So I say while x is less than five. That's the condition I want. I'm going to perform some action. I will log x is currently, and then I'm going to say plus x here, so that prints out. 
and then I'm also going to log x is still less than 5, adding 1 to x. And then finally, to make sure this doesn't run forever, I'm going to say x is equal to x plus 1. So before we run this, let's break down what's actually happening here. I start off with x equals 0. This is outside this while loop. Then inside this while loop, I'll say while x is less than 5, I want you to execute this block of code. And the first block of code, or the first line of code on line 4 says just x is currently and then whatever the current number of x is. And then, as long as x is still less than 5, my condition, I'll also log x is still less than 5, adding 1 to x. And then finally, on line 7, I'll say x is equal to x plus 1. So I reassign x to the current x plus 1. And I'll also show you later on some syntax to have a shortcut of doing this sort of operation. But let's save that. And now let's run our browser, or refresh our browser page here, and see what we get. So we get a lot of output. Let's expand this and see what's happening here. So I get x is currently 0. That makes sense. So it's still less than 5. I add 1 to x. x is currently 1. And this keeps going all the way until it prints out x is currently 4, which makes sense. If x is currently 4, I would log x is still less than 5, adding 1 to x. And note that once I add 1 to x, then x becomes 5. And 5 is no longer less than 5. It's equal to a 5. So the while loop stops operating, which is why we never see x is currently 5. And that's the very basics of how a while loop works. OK, now let's add in some manual break conditions, which will exit out of the loop. And it's going to use the keyword break. So right now, I'm going to start with variable x is equal to 0. I'll say while x is less than 5. And I'm going to console again log x is currently x. And then here, I'm going to add in some control flow with an if statement. And I will say if x is equal to 3, I'm going to log x is equal to 3. And that's all I'll do for now. So let's run this code again and see what happens. So it looks like very much the same code, 0, 1, 2, 3, except when x is currently 3, before I say x is less than 5, I get this big announcement, x is equal to 3. Now let's actually try to break the while loop on this certain condition. And the way we can do that is by adding in the special keyword, break. And this will break out of the top level loop it's in. Basically what it says, what this is saying is, if x is equal to 3, log this and then break out of the top level loop you find this keyword in. And that happens to be this while loop. So let's save this, expand this, and refresh the page. And now we see when I refresh, it stops at this S x is equal to 3 line. So it says x is equal to 3, and then it breaks out of that while loop. And that's how we can use the keyword break to essentially prematurely break out of a while loop so that we don't have to wait until this condition is naturally met to be false. And that's really all there is to the while loop. We'll use it later on in the course, but as a quick exercise, I want you to do this. Write a while loop that prints out only the even numbers from 1 to 10. So again, just to clarify what I want you to do right now, I'll write it in here as a comment. Write a while loop that prints out only the even numbers from 1 to 10. Okay, so pause the video, see if you can do it on your own and then I'm going to write out the solution for this question. Just write a while loop that prints out only the even numbers from 1 to 10. Okay, so let's get started with this. I'm going to clear everything I have here in my editor. Hopefully you were able to actually do this yourself, or at least attempt it yourself, but everything's clear, so let's try it out. Okay, so let's see how we can attempt to solve this problem. First thing I'm going to do is create a variable called num, and start it off equal to 1. Then I'm going to create my while loop, and I want to go from numbers 1 to 10. So I will say, while my number is less than 11, and let's just start off with a very simple example. I will log the number, and then say num is equal to num plus 1. Save this, and let's see if this works. Refresh the page, and here I get all the numbers from 1 to 10. 
but the assignment is to only print out these even numbers. So I need some sort of method to check if a number is even. And hopefully you remember from the number or the very basics of JavaScript lecture, that very first JavaScript lecture, we taught you the mod operator. So I'm going to say if num mod two is equal to zero, then I can do something and I know that the number is even. So I will log that number. So what does that actually mean? Well, remember that mod checks for a remainder. And I know if a number divided by two leaves a remainder equal to zero, then that number is even. So six divided by two has no remainder, eight divided by two has no remainder, etc. Okay. And then lastly, I wanna make sure this doesn't run forever. So outside of that if, I'm going to say num is equal to num plus one. So let's save that and see if I refresh the page, it works. And there we have it, two, four, six, eight, ten. And those are all the even numbers from one to 10 using a while loop. Take your time if this was a little confusing for you. And some key things to remember here is this mod operator. This is a really common way to check if a number is even. And also key to this is to remember to increase the number and to remember to increase the number outside of this if statement. If you only had it inside of this if statement, that would cause problems because you would only be adding one if the number was even. You wouldn't do it on the odd numbers. And you can tell if something is within the block using these curly brackets as indicators. And indentation for JavaScript doesn't matter a whole lot, although you should try to keep your code readable and clean. Later on when we talk about Python, indentation is going to be a huge aspect of it. Okay, so thanks everyone, and I will see you at the next lecture where we're going to begin to discuss for loops. I'll see you there. Hello everyone, and welcome to part seven, for loops. So we're going to be learning about the most basic for loop in JavaScript in this lecture. And if you've only dealt with for loops in Python before, you may actually want to watch this lecture instead of just reading the notes, because the syntax for a for loop or a basic for loop in JavaScript is going to appear quite different to you versus Python's for loop. Okay, so what is a for loop? Well, a for loop allows you to continually execute code, usually a specific number of times, or linked to the elements in a sequence. Now, JavaScript has three types of for loops. It has its most basic for loop, which just iterates through some block of code a certain number of times. Then it has the for in construct, which loops through a JavaScript object. And a JavaScript object is a data structure in JavaScript that we haven't covered yet. And then there's also the for of loop, which is used with JavaScript arrays, which again is another data structure we haven't actually covered yet. So until we cover those, we'll leave for in loops and for of loops aside for now. And as a quick note, previously we used the notation num is equal to num plus one, when during a loop we wanted to increment the variable num by just one. There's also two other ways of writing that, and that is num plus equal to one, or num plus plus. And if you wanted to subtract one, you would just say num minus equals one or num minus minus. So these are all the same. All three of these statements are doing the exact same thing. That's just a heads up because with JavaScript, the most common one you'll see is the very last one, num plus plus. All right, this is what the most basic version of a for loop in JavaScript looks like. You have your for keyword statement, and then you have three other statements separated by semicolon inside of parentheses and inside curly brackets, you execute some code for the for loop. So let's actually describe what each of these statements represents, and we'll show you an example as we go along. So statement one is executed before the loop or that code block even begins. And that can be something like defining the variable i is equal to zero. And we can think of that similar to the while loop where we just said something like num is equal to zero or x is equal to zero. So statement one is executed before the loop even really starts. Then we have statement two, which is there in the middle. And statement two, defines the condition for running the loop. And in this case, we can almost think of this for loop as just another syntax way of writing a while loop. So what's an example of that? Well, statement two could be something like this, while i is less than five. So here we can see we're almost just rewriting a while loop inside of this for statement. We're starting off with the variable i is equal to zero, and we're saying keep running this loop while i is less than five. And then finally, statement three is what is executed each time after the loop cycles through once. So just like a while loop we saw earlier, we may want to incrementally add to i. So here, what this for loop is saying is start off with the variable i is equal to zero. And while i is less than five, 
do some code, and then every cycle you're going to add one to i, or i++. All right, so let's see some examples of for loops in the editor. All right, so here's my editor, and I have my browser with my console open, and it's linked just as we've done in previous lectures. Let's start off with the most basic for loop that we initially discussed. So again, I'm gonna say something like four, and I can actually hit enter here. Note that Adam gives you the three options, the four, four in, and then four of. We'll start with just the most basic four. We hit enter, and what's really nice is Adam takes care of a lot of the stuff right now. It takes care of statement one, that initialization of a variable, takes care of statement two, which is what we actually want to run through, kind of the while condition, and then I++, or statement three, what we want to happen after every time this is run. Now, let's actually change the array.length to just be less than five. And we're going to say console.log number is, and then we'll concatenate it with i. So let's save this and actually run this here. And here I can see number is zero, one, two, three, and four. And hopefully you can see this is basically just another way of rewriting a for loop, or excuse me, a while loop, where we have some initial condition, the while condition, and then what we want to do after every time this loop run. And like I mentioned earlier, this i++ is just another way of writing i is equal to i plus one. So I can save that, and if I refresh, I'll get the exact same result. And another note is that this doesn't actually have to be i. You could call this whatever you want. So you could say variable num, while num is less than five, and we could say num plus plus, write that as num, save this, we refresh, and we get the exact same result. It's most commonly used for i, so keep that in mind, you'll see i a lot, but sometimes it might be helpful to you to rename it if it helps the readability of your code. But more often than not, you're just going to see it as i. And it's so often i that that's why Adam Text Editor auto fills it to be i. Okay, so let's continue on with another example. I'm going to create a variable called word, and let's just have it be the first few letters of the alphabet. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. Okay, and then I'll start typing four, hit enter, and I'm going to say for i is equal to zero, i array.length, and Adam Text Editor actually auto highlights array for me to change it to something. So I will change it to word, and then you can see that it's actually auto filling that in for me over inside the for loop, which is quite nice and I'm going to log this. So I will say log, whoops, let me click somewhere to deactivate that, and then we'll say log, and I'm gonna input word indexed at that location. Okay, so let's save this, and what do you think is gonna happen here? Take some time. So we'll refresh, and we see here now we get a, b, c, d, e, f, g, all the way to k. So again, this is just a way of kind of rewriting the while loop, so we start at i equals to zero, and while i is less than the length of the actual word, keep incrementing i, and then print out the index location at i, so a, b, c, d, etc. All right, now let's show you another example where let's say we wanted to skip every other letter or something. So to make that obvious, I will do something like this, a, b, a, b, a, b, a, b, a, b. And then I'll write a for loop here, and I'm gonna keep most things the same, except over here, where it says i++, I can do something like i is equal to i plus two. And let's log this again, and put that inside. And now what do you think is going to happen when I refresh this page? Well, I can see A printed out five times, and if something is repeatedly input into the console, a Google Chrome will actually just put a little number here next to it instead of flooding your screen with repeated code or repeated output. So this little number here represents that A was printed out five times, which makes sense because if you look at this, we have one, two, three, four, five A's in that word. So hopefully you can see here that it doesn't have to just increment by one, it can increment by any number you want, or it can even go down, it can decrease. Okay, so that's all we need to know about for loops in JavaScript for now. Coming up next, we're going to do a quick exercise just to practice your understanding. I'll see you at the next lecture.
Hello everyone and welcome back to part 8, loop exercises. So you've learned enough about loops, it's time to do just a few exercises. The exercises are located under the JavaScript level 1 folder and the file you're looking for is called part 8 underscore loops underscore exercise dot js. And then there's also a solutions JavaScript, so make sure you don't peek at the solutions before attempting them on your own. In the next lecture, I'll be walking through the actual exercise solutions. So check out the JavaScript. All the instructions are comment code in that actual file. Just open it up and follow the directions. I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome back to part eight, where we're going to be going over the solutions to the loop exercise questions from the previous lecture. So let's continue. I'm going to open up my editor to get started. Okay, here I have the actual problems uploaded in the JavaScript with the comment that I had to follow. And what we're going to be doing first is problem one, where I had to use a for loop to print or console log out the word hello five times. And we never actually did something quite like this, but hopefully you were able to figure it out with both methods. So with a while loop, let's show you how we can do that. We'll say variable x is equal to zero. And you could have chosen any variable name here. The name doesn't actually matter. Then we'll say a while loop. And I will say while x is less than five, I'm going to console.log hello. And then I want to remember to add one to x and increment it. So now if I run my code, I see hello and it's been output five times. Google Chrome just lets you know that with this little shortcut, the bubble of five there. Up next, we have the for loop and I wanted to use a for loop to do this. So essentially you can just break down what we were doing up here above. So I have variable i is equal to zero since i is going to be less than five, I'll put that here and I'll leave i plus plus and then I can actually just copy and paste the console log command. And just to make sure it's actually working, I'm going to say something like hello with for loop. We'll save that. Let's run this code and I see hello and then hello with for loop. They both ran five times. Great. Let's move on to problem two. Problem two was just to use loops to console.log or print out all the odd numbers from one to 25. And we wanted to do this using two methods, the while loop and then a for loop. Let's start off with the while loop. I'm going to make a variable called num. And in the solutions, I actually just reassign num from a previous problem. And then I'm going to say while my num is less than 25, if num mod two is not equal to zero. Remember previously, if we wanted to check for an even number, we said num mod two equal to zero. In this case, we're doing the exact opposite for odd numbers. I'm going to log that num. And then I also want to make sure that I continually add to num. So I'll just say num plus plus. So let's make sure that actually worked. I'm going to refresh my page here. And there are all the odd numbers, one all the way to 23 for the while loop. And now for the for loop, let's do that as well. I'm going to say for, and then I'm going to fix some of these. So it says instead of the actual length of the array, this is going to be five. Let's expand this a little bit. So I'm going to say if I mod two is not equal to zero log i. And that's really all there is to this. Let's make sure my brackets are balanced. So we'll save that. And let's comment everything else out so we make sure that only that is running. So we'll save this, scroll all the way down, refresh my page. And here I only see one through three. So let me make sure I went all the way. That should have been 25. Okay, now let's refresh our page. And there we have it, one through 23. Great, and that's how you could do it with a for loop. So that's it, just two pretty simple problems, and hopefully you can begin to see the relationship between the while loop and the for loop. Okay, thanks everybody. And in the next lecture, we're going to get practice on everything we covered in JavaScript level one with a little bit of an assessment project. Thanks, and I'll see you at the next lecture.
Hello everyone, and welcome back to part 9, JavaScript Level 1 Project. So we've completed all the normal lectures for JavaScript Level 1, and now it's time to actually do a project. And for this project, you'll be creating a simple website that asks a visitor questions using JavaScript and the prompt function that we worked with earlier. However, through all of these questions, you're going to be secretly checking to see if there's a spy present, and the spy is going to answer the questions in a very particular way. Behind the scenes, you're going to be using JavaScript to check for certain correct answers to the questions. And if you find the spy due to the correct answers, you're going to leave them a secret message in the console for them to check. Okay, you're going to be needing to check the part 9 underscore js underscore project.html file for the full instructions and the full correct answers. An example solution of the JavaScript file is located under part 9.js. So remember to link to your own .js script before getting started. So again, you're only going to be editing a JavaScript file. You won't actually be touching any HTML. All right, let's briefly explore the instruction page and see an example of what it should look like after you're done with it. I'm going to hop over to the editor and browser now. Okay, here I have the actual HTML document open in my editor. And I also have it linked to the JavaScript file that contains the solutions. And this is what it looks like over here in the browser. So again, just quickly to point out, if you scroll all the way down, on the part 9 JavaScript project.html page, right here under the script connection, it will connect to the solution script. So it'll actually connect to part 9.js. That's what you can connect it to if you want to see what an example solution looks like in your browser. But I recommend that once you're done dealing with that, you change the source to your own JavaScript file so you can play around with working through the solution. Again, everything you're doing is just in a JavaScript file. You won't actually be editing any HTML for this. So let me show you what the actual HTML looks like. I've linked it here in my browser. I'm going to zoom in a little bit so we can read it together. But here we have the Welcome to Part 9, your JavaScript Level 1 project. And like I mentioned, for this project, you're going to be building a generic website that just seems to ask some mundane questions to normal users, but secretly you are looking for a spy. And anyone visiting your website is going to be asked a series of questions, but only the spy is going to give you specific answers that you expect. And if all the questions are answered correctly, you're going to post a secret message in the console for the spy to read. So it's up to you whatever the secret message is, but you're going to use console.log if they answer the questions correctly. So here are the four conditions you're going to be checking for the spy. So the spy has the same first letter of her first name and her last name. So for example, someone could be named Jose Johnson and J and J match. So that's the first letter and last letter. So that's a correct condition for the spy. The spy is also between the age of 20 and 30, exclusive of 20 and 30. So, for example, a 26-year-old spy works. Then the spy is also at least 170 centimeters tall. Here we have 175 centimeters. And then the spy has a pet name that ends with the letter Y. And in this case, a pet name of Sammy would work. So you're going to ask the spy for their first name, last name, what is their age, what is, what is their height in centimeters, and what is their pet name. And if they answer everything correctly according to these conditions, so you're going to check these conditions using everything you learned about control flow, you will log a secret message to the console. And then they can inspect the page, look at the console, and see if you left them anything. All right. So again, we're just using JavaScript here, and you can prompt for the information in any order you want. And you can even do things like separate the first name prompt from the last name prompt. That'll probably make your life a little easier. But all we're doing is just checking to see if these four conditions are true. This one, this one, this one, and this one. So let's actually refresh this page and see what happens, what this actually looks like. I'm going to refresh, and it says, hello and welcome. Please enter your first name. We'll say Jose. Enter your last name. We'll say Johnson. How old are you? We'll say 26. We'll say we're 175 centimeters and the net the name of our pet is Sammy I'll hit OK it says thank you so much for the information I hit OK and that's it it looks like nothing happened but if I inspect and go to my console it says welcome comrade you've passed the spy test and that's exactly what you're going to be doing let's refresh this page and make sure that if I just input garbage so let's say my name is Andy Will I'm 42, I'm 10 centimeters tall, my name of my pet is, I don't know, Fad, hit OK, and it says, sorry, nothing to see here. Okay, hopefully you get an idea of what this project's actually getting at. In the next lecture, I'll be coding out some solutions in the JavaScript file. 
Thanks everyone. Hope you enjoy the project. I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome back. Hopefully you already attempted the JavaScript level one project because in this lecture we'll be coding through an example solution for it. Okay, I'm excited so let's get started by hopping over to the editor. Okay, so here I have my editor open. I've linked the HTML file to my own script. My script is right now empty so nothing's going on when I refresh this page. So let's expand our editor, add everything we need, and then we'll test it out with the actual website page. So I'm going to zoom in just a little more so we can see everything clearly. Okay, the first thing I need to do is have the four conditions that I'm going to be checking. Remember those four conditions are this. It's the name condition, so I'm going to make variables for these. And the name condition will have it be null to start off with. And the name condition is, does their first name, first letter of their first name match the first letter of their last name? And you can actually not have them be null. They can be anything because we're going to be reassigning these later on. But I'm just going to make them null to be clear that they're nothing right now. And if we want, we can put semicolons there. The age condition, so they have to be between 20 and 30 exclusive. We also have the height condition. And that's going to be null. And then we also finally have the pet name condition. So I will say var pet condition is null. Okay, so those are the four conditions that I'm checking for. But remember, I'm actually going to need to add, ask some questions first. So let's put those questions at the top. I'm going to grab the first name. It's going to be a prompt, whoops, not what I wanted, a prompt. And I will ask first name, please. And you can basically write as much or as little as you want in that. Then we'll ask for the last name. And I'm going to, ah, oh, sorry about that. <laughs> there it is, prompt, okay. I'm going to ask for the last name, please. And then the next variable I want is age. So I'm going to ask, how old are you? question mark. I also want height. So that's another prompt. So just a bunch of prompts that we ask the user when they reach the page. What is your height? question mark. And then finally, pet name. We'll ask for a prompt. What is your pet name? question mark. So we have everything. After all of that, I'm just going to say an alert. Thank you so much for the information. And it doesn't matter a whole lot whether we define these four condition variables before or after this, but I like the idea of grabbing all the variables that we need from the user first and then having all our logic below it. So we have those four conditions. Let's start using control flow to actually check if these conditions are true or false. So the first one we need to check is the name condition. So remember the name condition asks, is the first letter of their first name and the first letter of their last name the same thing? So I'm going to say, if first name index at zero is equal to last name index at zero, set the name condition to be equal to true. Else, the name condition is going to be equal to false. And that's a quick and easy way we can check if their first letter of their first name matches the first letter of their last name. Now we want to check the age condition. So how do we do that? Well, we want to say if age is greater than 20, so remember we're doing exclusive, so I don't put that equal sign, and age is less than 30, so we make sure not to overshoot this, I will say that the age condition is equal to true. Else, I know they didn't pass the age test, so age condition is equal to false. And hopefully now you can see why we could have assigned something else for the age condition. We could have assigned them all to be true or all to be false to begin with. Moving along, we have our age, we have the first name check, and now I want to check the height condition. So I will say if 
height is greater than or equal to 170. Remember, it was at least 170. Then I want my height condition. We can see Adam helping us out here to be true. And just like we've done last time, I'll say else height condition is equal to false. Pretty simple and pretty straightforward so far. And then last but not least, I want to make sure that the pet name is ending with Y. This one's a little tricky because we haven't shown anything quite like this, but hopefully you're able to figure it out. I'll say if the pet name, and then somehow I want to grab the last letter of the pet name. So how do I actually do that? Well, we know how to grab the first letter, which is just zero. But if I want to grab the last letter, I'm going to have to take into account that pet names can be of different lengths. And one way I can do that is by calling pet name dot length. So we might think that this gives us the very last letter, but remember indexing starts at zero, which means I need to subtract one from this in order to make it work. So you can imagine that if I had the pet name just be the letter A, and I want to check the last letter of the string of a single letter, I'd have to check zero, right? So even if it has length of one, I'd have to say one minus one to actually grab that last letter. So that's just a quick explanation of why I have to do the minus one here. It's because indexing starts at zero. And if you don't believe me, you can kind of check it out and play with it yourself. And I want to make sure this is equal to y. And if that's the case, then I know the pet condition will be reassigned to true. Else, I'll say pet condition is equal to false. Great. So I have the pet name there, and now I just want to check if all four conditions are true. So check all conditions. And what I'm going to do here is say if the name condition is true and the age condition is true and the height condition is true and the pet condition is true, I'm going to log something like welcome spy, else we can either not do anything or just say nothing to see here. And sometimes what confuses beginners is the fact that I'm just writing here the actual condition. I'm not saying something like name condition equals true and age condition equals true, etc. But remember, these are already Booleans themselves. So these conditions should already be Booleans by the time they get to this stage. They're either all true or all false or some combination of true and false. Meaning I don't need to actually check is equal equal true because they're actually all conditional checks. So basically it's gonna be something like true and false and true and false or false and false and false or true and true and true, etc. Okay, so you can always review the actual part nine dot JavaScript if you want the written code for everything I just did here. But let's save this and actually test it out to make sure it worked. Going to expand this. We are going to refresh. And here we see first name, please. I'll input Jose. Last name, we'll say John. How old am I? We'll say we're 27. What is my height? I'll say 180 centimeters. Pet name, I'll say Frankie of Hawaii. Thanks so much for the information. We right click, inspect, check the console, and it says welcome spy. Let's make sure the inverse is true. So if I refresh this page, first name, just gonna insert some garbage, last name, some other garbage. How old am I? I'm 12 years old. We'll say we're 120 centimeters and pet name is Alf. And it says nothing to see here. Perfect. So it looks like our solution worked correctly. Okay, if you have any questions, feel free to post them to the Q&A forums, but you are now complete with JavaScript level one. It's time to move on to JavaScript level two. Thanks, and I'll see you at the next section of the course.